I would like to introduce the, uh, the second a keynote speaker of the day. Um, again, for all of us, you know, he needs no introduction. I'm just gonna put one thing briefly. Um, now, when I was a chief resident at Baylor College of Medicine, that was back in 2000 to 2003, uh, Dr. Shulam showed up. And suffice to say, um, my first lab nephrectomy was with him. So I've been his resident and <laughs> at times I do feel like I'm always his resident. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, again, uh, it's a tremendous privilege and honor uh, to welcome back Dr. Shulam. Uh, again, he's been a tremendous, um, uh, I was to say, you know, my mentor and um, there are things that I've been doing all throughout my career that um, it has been guiding. So thank you, uh, Dr. Chulam, and welcome back and look forward to your talk this afternoon about the, uh, your experience in academic industry. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, before I start, I just want to first say thank you. Um, and I want to first thank Dr. Weiss, because when I came here in 2012, he was an incredibly gracious former chief. Um, and to my expectations, he outlasted me here. Um, <laughs> so that's great. And then to all the faculty, those that were here, we used to, I used to call them the original six. So Dinesh and Harris and the others that were here. And then all those that um, I had a, a fortunate uh, opportunity to recruit, either from within the state, out of the state, within Rhode Island, and it's been great. And I want to thank all of you for giving me, uh, or giving me the uh, opportunity to support you. And uh, have been, you know, have been part of the team here at Yale. It's been an amazing morning for me to watch where everyone has gone and the work that's going on. It's great to see Juan and what he's doing in San Diego. Um, I love to see what you know. Dan's not here, but with Dan's doing with Ola, Preston. I mean, oh, we're we'll saying <laughs> Preston. We didn't want to do uh, target biopsies, and of course, we went to UCLA to work with Lenny Marks. Uh, it's great uh, to all the residents. Again, thank you for giving us the opportunity to teach you. Uh, I think it's an amazing. Um, this is probably the most satisfying portion of uh, being in academia is actually working with the residents um, and the fellows. Uh, you keep us humble, and I think your questions and your um, curiosity it also keeps us young. Dr. White would admit to that. That's why he's still here. Um, and then also to the administrative staff, uh, it's phenomenal because everything we do, as you can see, without Jody and others around, nothing would get done. So we're thankful for that. So I just want to thank everyone because it was an amazing eight and a half years. I had no idea I was going to go into academia. I mean, into industry, and um, I get calls now all over the country. The first person that called me when I took the job was Dean Gill, and all he started doing was firing questions. At me. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? What's going on? How do you do this? And then I had dinner with him three weeks ago in LA, and um, he wants to work with us and do things together. But um, I'll share with you, and I'd like to hear questions as to why you know what what makes you what you think about when you hear that I'm in industry. I did not think this was gonna happen. So to Dr. Weiss's comments earlier, you know, take the fork in the road. Well, I came to a T in the road. It wasn't a fork, it was a T, either the right or left. And um, I was thinking about, and I had interviewed at some dean, the dean positions in the country. And instead of taking that right, I went left. Um, it's been 20 months now, and I will tell you, uh, it's a phenomenal journey. I know nothing. I am learning every day. And everyone I work with knows way more than I. I'll talk to you a little bit about more what I, what I do, but what I want to do for the next just few minutes is go through what I've learned. I guess, Dr. Weiss, once you and I get old enough and have enough great here, we can get up here and show them we can talk a little bit more philosophical about life. But uh, I want to share with you what I've learned in, 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 about leadership and being in large organizations over the last you know 20 years of my life. And I can tell you that I met with the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, who now stepped down, was Alex Gorski, in the first three months, and he said, What do you think? He says, How do you find JJ? I said, Just like Yale, matrix mm -hmm. complex. There are people who are institutionalized, you think one way, new people come in and want to do things differently. So, what I'm telling you is, doesn't no matter where you are, whether you're Yale, UCLA, Johnson and Johnson, GE, it's all the same, and it all has to do with people. People are, if, once you throw people into the equation, this shit happens. So, it's all the same. So, top 10 list for me. Number one, I learned this initially at the Cancer Center. Listen, we all come into a new situation when we think we know what's going on and we're quick to start <coughs> making recommendations. And what I learned at the Cancer Center, because I made that mistake, and what has served me well at J&J is my first 90 days, I said nothing. Just listened and I asked everyone to teach me. And I think humility and just asking for help, unbelievably useful. And be slow to assume. The other thing I, you know, I, was, I got to J&J, I was like, why the hell are we doing this? Like, this is stupid. We should do it this way. 
And my mentor, a J&J, uh, who's head of R&D for all of Johnson Johnson at, at Peter Shen, always said, stop, let me give you the historical perspective, why we are where we are today. And once he did that, it made sense. And also then for me to make the change, I knew where they were coming from and it was easier to take people along on the journey. So I think these two are very important, especially when you are entering a new um, organization. So even for the residents, when you leave here and you have your first job, these two are very important. And once you have credibility, then you can start to rock the boat. Engage stakeholders. And so sidebars, whatever you want to call it, you know, when you want to do change, you don't make the change shouldn't come from the top. It should, it can originate from the top, but be sure that you go around and all the stakeholders that are part of this have an understanding of where you want to go and why you want to go there before you bring it to the greater audience. Because when you do that, it'll make it a lot easier. So at, at J and J they call it walk the square, but I have changed it. I say it's called walk the polygon because it's not a four wall system. And at J and J sometimes it's an octagon, sometimes it's a triangle. And I said, and if you miss one of the sides, you're going to have a problem. Uh oh, Jody, you could have a problem here, Jody. Oh, you did you do something? Mm -hmm. I was getting the Zoom controls to go away. Oh, so it's working now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, be inclusive. So this is something I learned when I was getting my PhD with Dr. Schur down at Baylor College of Medicine. I remember we were sitting around and we were trying to determine who should be on the paper. And he said, who did the work? And he listed it. And everyone looked at that and said, I was too big of a list. He said, look, be inclusive. If people have participated, they should get recognition. So I think this has been key for me. So I tell every, everyone, both when I was at Yale and now at J&J, when we're doing things, anyone who wants to be involved should be involved. So be inclusive, not exclusive. Don't worry about ownership. That's key. The biggest impediment to moving things forward in life is because people want to have ownership. And then what that does is alienate others, and it creates kind of competition <coughs> and obstruction. And so if you just sit back, and I'll tell you, I did it here with CBIT. Mark and I started CBIT, and there were a lot of people who wanted to take credit for it. And I just said, that's the big, that's the greatest form of collaboration is for someone to take credit for your work. Sit back, let it happen. Because you know what? At the end of the day, everyone will know what who has done what. When you're younger, you know, first year, you want to have that credit. You want to build that reputation. If you can just sit back on your heels a little bit and not worry about that, <clears throat> you will get the work done. And eventually, as Luca Busi used to tell me, cream will rise to the top. Praise the team when there are successes. So how many of you um, read the book, Good to Great? Okay, good book. So there's two books you should read, Good to Great and Teams. It's amazing. Both those books are great about leadership. But Good to Great, there's a, a chapter about how to take responsibility. And they said a great leader when there's success, opens up the windows and looks out over the crowd and thanks everyone. And when there are failures, looks into the mirror and takes responsibility. And poor leaders do the exact opposite. So praise the team when there are successes and shoulder the responsibility when there are failures. Because my job as a leader now at J&J is that I want my, I have 500 people around the world, physicians, APPs, I want to, and I'll tell you a little bit what they're responsible for in a minute, but I want them to take risks. I want them to be successful. I want them to challenge themselves and challenge the world. People are afraid of doing that because of the, resp the responsibility of that and the backlash. As a leader, you shoulder that responsibility and you give the team the freedom to actually execute. And this is also something I've learned over the years, but Paul Stoffels is a former chief scientific officer at J&J. Phenomenal person, multiple companies started, uh, was responsible for the Ebola vaccine. Recently left to start up another company, but this was also, when I met with him, this is what he told me. He said, I'm here to make sure the team takes on risks, but I shoulder the responsibility. How many of you have heard of Servant Leader? Robert Greene, 1970 manuscript. Another thing that you should read, because what it does is it flips the pyramid upside down. 
So you think of the leader being at the top and then the team kind of comes down in that normal organizational structure. He flips it upside down in this 1970 work. And I think it's unbelievably important because the job as a leader is to make everyone successful. You do that by giving everyone the independence, shouldering responsibility, but they should be part of the decision making. So the old world is where the leader makes the decision everyone follows. The new world, the servant leadership world, we listen to everyone, everyone can contribute. So I actually say, I'm not a micromanager. I'm here to hire people that I think are fired up. They're an engine, they want to go. My job is to get out of the way. When they need advice, I'm here. They need resources, I'm here. And I'm hoping that many of you thought that's what I did for you when you came here. And that's what I want to, I mean, I want to, we, we never, we never should stop evolving. Don't fall back and think you've done a great job. I was, every day I go to bed at night and I think about what, what could I have done better? And I think I used to do that when I operated and I do that now as a leader, but be a servant leader and think about community, environment, empathy, passion, build that within your team. And it's not about top down. Give honest and constructive criticism. This is hard for me. It's hard to, you know, it's great to tell someone doing great. It's great to tell someone, or it's easy to tell someone they're doing a great job. Hard when you have to tell them that you need them to do something a bit different. It takes a little bit of um, nuance and how to do that so that, because can you give bad advice or constructive advice and everyone walks out and they're, in a way, no one's going to be happy, but they're understanding. And that's really what you want to do. And I think, the key here is to be honest and constructive. And this is the last point. This is what I've learned recently when I was at uh, J&J. Every year they do an evaluation. Everyone gets evaluated. And everyone gets evaluated. So we all have reporting structures. And everyone who reports into you, you have to write an evaluation. But before you do that evaluation, you have to go ahead and get 10 to 15 uh, evaluations from others. Get that input. And then you rate them. Everyone gets rated on the what and the how. And it's a simple scale, exceptional, strong, moderate, or uh, poor. And the key here is that you can be exceptional in the what and poor on the how. And what they're trying to drive is that you're both exceptional on the what and the how. So just because you're good at what you do, but you're an asshole doing it, that's a failure. And J&J has a credo about this. And so it's made me think. And so, and we have people that are okay on the what, but they're phenomenal on the how. So what you want to do is train them and help them and surround them with the resources so that they can execute. So these are my learnings from the last 30 years, you know, starting as a resident when I was with Dr. Walsh at Johns Hopkins, who was an amazing leader. Then at UCLA with Dr. DeKernian, an amazing leader. Coming to Yale, working with Dr. Weiss, Mark Saltzman, the dean and the other chairs are amazing. And now that I'm at J&J &J and I get to see at another level, and I'll tell you, that's what I'll tell you about a little bit now before we go into the final piece of the presentation, because I can't take an hour to speak if that's kill me. My attention span is very short. Um, with J&J, &J, you sit down now with 140,000 person company, global in every nation around the world. And there's a single CEO. And the CEO when I joined was Alex Gorski. It's now Joaquin Dorado. And I'm very fortunate because I work very closely with both of them. And I watch them when they're in the room. I watch what they do. And it's an amazing stage that they have and the impact that they can have. Um, so I'm still learning. You know, I'm 60 in a couple of months. I'm still learning. And I think I will continue to learn until I stop working. And you need that mindset. And I'm impressed by the people I'm surrounded with at j, &J as well. So let me tell you a little bit about what I do at J&J. So I had no idea I was going to get this job. So I was looking at other positions, thinking about what I wanted to do. And then about two years ago, Johnson & Johnson called. I had made one visit. I don't know if many of you recall. There was a company called Verb Surgical. It was a, um, a, joint, a joint collaboration between J&J &J and Google. And it was to build a surgical robot. It started about four or five years ago. They had a new CEO come in about two and a half years ago, Curtis Zavarzin. I worked with him for the surgery quest, you know, we all have ear seal. He started that company, I was assigned to the advisory for that. And he took over this job, he called me out in September and said, hey, I just got this new position, film this robot, can you just come out for a day and take a look at this and tell me what you think. So I went out there and I said, that's pretty cool, we're on Google campus. I said, this is pretty neat. And that, in, that meeting, serendipitously, you know, came up and um, about four months later, his boss, Peter Shen, who I now work for, Said we need to find a surgeon coming and help us. We're trying to restructure, and we need a, like a lead surgeon for all of JJ Medtech. And he said, I think I have a person for you. 
So I gave them my name. And what happened was that they have the talent acquisition teams, they made some calls, and then eventually I was in negotiation with them. Totally unexpected. And in fact, my first two calls with them, I was almost arrogant because they started asking questions and I said, look, I have no interest. I'll tell you what I do and what I love to do and what I've done in the past. And if, if it kind of resonates with you, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Otherwise, there's no need to. And those were my two, two, my two first meetings. And then after that, I started to realize, holy shit, this could be a beautiful job. So then I got nervous and I was a lot different in my, in my conversation. <laughs> um, so they hired me to be pre clinical. So let me tell you about JJ. JJ, 140,000 um, employee company, unbelievable breadth and depth. They have essentially three companies with under one umbrella. So there's pharmaceutical, which is Janssen, there's MedTech, and then there's consumer. Consumer, Band Aids, Motrin, everything you get, Tylenol. Consumer is about a $15 billion business. MedTech, our sector is a $28 to $29 billion sector. And Johnson is a $45 billion sector. So it's almost a $100 billion organization. So and there's only two AAA bond uh, companies in the United States, in the world right now. It's J&J and Microsoft, just to give you an idea of its, its um, impact. So they hired me. So within MedTech, we just changed the name from MedDevice to MedTech. There are four franchises. The Pew Synthes, Orthopedics. Ethicon Surgical, you know Ethicon Surgical and everything they provide. CSS, which is Cardiac Surgical Subspecialties, which is Biosense Webster, which does all the atrial fibrillation devices, which is pretty cool. And that's probably the number one um, asset in that portfolio. And then they have uh, Clarin, which is uh, EMT uh, balloon systems. They have uh, Serenovus, which is for neurovascular. They have Mentor, which is for breast implants. And then we have Vision. So you had, you've heard of AccuDo, so J&J. They have all the contacts. And then within vision, there's two subdivisions. One is contacts, and the other is um, vision surgery. That makes up MedTech. All that rolls up to Ashley McAvoy, who is our, basically, a call company group chair, but our leader. And then her program is divided into two arms, an R&D arm and a commercial arm. The R&D arm is led by Peter Shen. And I report directly to Peter Shen, but I sit, I was fortunate when they created my position, they gave me the opportunity to sit on her. She has 18 people. We have a total of 7,000 employees and we're about 28 billion. She has 18 people that sit on her leadership team. So I was, they gave me that position when I joined and I'm the only position on the leadership team for many months. Just to give you an idea. So I'm the, everyone else is an MBA and then there's me. So uh, it makes for interest. But it's good because what I bring to the table, no one else can bring. They hired me to be the global head of preclinical, clinical, and medical. I had no idea what that meant, and I still don't, but I'll tell you what it's about. And I was talking, I forgot who I was talking to recently. Awesome. So, when we identify and the idea around that, we come up with a potential solution, a new type of stapler or a new energy device. That device then, R&D, works very closely with the medical clinical affairs group, which is what we have. We have 500 people around the world. Many of them are physicians, but we also have a lot of APPs and non-physicians or non-medical people, but all of them linked in some way of having some experience in the medical uh, industry. We work very closely because what we have to do is say, okay, is that truly an unmet need? So we want to make sure we have the voice of the physicians at the table globally. And then once we think we have a solution, we then say, okay, what are our claims around that solution? What are we claiming that it can do? less bleeding, whatever it is. What do we need to start testing? So that's where my team comes in and they do all the preclinical testing, preclinical research. So that's all the animal and in-animal testing to de-risk it and make sure there's safety and efficacy. Once we know we have that, and that becomes some of the data that then goes to the regulatory bodies like the FDA, but you know, in Europe it's MD, um, EUR, in China it's the YY standard. So we have to look at all this globally and be sure that we're checking all those boxes. So our pre our preclinical team does all that work. Then once we're ready to launch, we then do clinical studies because now we have to do all the investigative initiated studies or sponsored studies to make sure that we truly do have safety and efficacy. And then once the product is launched, we have a whole medical team that follows the use of that product for its entire life cycle. So it's called life cycle management. And in the European Union right now, EU MDR, every one of our devices, we have to follow the outcome and every year publish a paper for every device about how it's doing. And if you're non-compliant, guess what? 
can't sell you any of your devices in that country or in that region. So that's what my team does. So it's called preclinical research, medical and clinical affairs, medical affairs team kind of working with you. They're usually the medical affairs, almost all of them are physicians. So he or she's working with the research arm. They're reaching, they're reaching out to the community to make sure that we're getting the, the voice of the customer, so to speak, back into our program. And then the clinical affairs team is responsible for all the clinical trials. That's necessary for the regulatory bodies and for the life cycle management. So that's what I was brought in to do. I have no idea how to do the job. Um, this is the funny thing, the higher you get up in life, the less you know about how things work. But my job is not to do the work. My job is to do these things, to make sure that they are a community, that they're effective, and that we make sure that they can execute what they do. So I'm going to transition now because I'm going to show you a little video. Um, everyone said, why did you leave? I can't tell you, for the first nine months, everyone I met, the first question, why did you leave Yale? I'm going to change. And I said, all right. So as you know, I've had a big interest in medical devices. All of you know that. So the most awesome we started see, um, see it here. When I was at UCLA, I started CASIT, which is a Center for Advanced Surgical and Interventional Technology. So I've always been interested in medical device design. And the reason for that was when I was at Hopkins, and I was working with Luca Busi in 1992, and they had done the first Latin practice in 1990, 1991 with uh, Ralph Klayman. He was, he was, he truly was a visionary. And he was like, how can we push things further? And I started working with him, and I was totally enthralled with laparoscopy. We we're talking about telesurgery, telementoring, teleconsultation at the time. So I spent a year in the lab with him. And I said, this is what I want to do. I, you know, I had gotten a PhD in immunology, I did B cell signaling, possibly the metabolism, possibly the metabolism, five years in the lab. And I thought for sure that's what I was going to do. And I got totally waylaid because I wanted to do, I love surgery, and I love what Luke Producer was doing. And the thing that bothered me most was when I walked around John, um, Johns Hopkins, and I looked at pictures in the OR from 1910, 1915, they were no different than what I saw in 1992. I was like, holy shit, it looks exactly the same. This is scary. And then I, I did do that. I had this one lithograph. If you look at the instruments that have been found in Pompeii at the Mount Vesuvius erupted, and they have, a, they have a kind of a panel of medical instruments, Holy shit, it looks exactly what was on the tables today. And the scalpels, the retractors, the human stats. I'm like, this is crazy. Nothing's changed. So I was so intrigued, but I said, we, we need to have impact here. So I've always been interested in advanced, or uh, I should say, novel technologies, robotics, new technology. But at the end of the day, what really has been driving me, and I, in 2000, when I was at UCLA, I created an equation. And the equation said surgical outcome is equal to judgment times skill. Okay, so let's think about that. So, and the reason why it's a product is that there are people, and we all know it, have really good judgment, but shitty skill. Guess what? They have poor outcome. Great skill, shitty judgment, bad outcome. So I'm sitting here, well, how do we fix this? And the other thing is, it was alluded to earlier, we look in this room, the bottom line is, at the end of the day, we're all humans, and our performance follows a Gaussian distribution standard deviation of one. So the bottom line is 67% of us are operating around the mean. Yet, we all think we're in the top 10%. And our patients think we're in the top 10%. That doesn't make sense. So I've always had this belief, and that's why I've been interested in medical device design for the last 22 years, is can we develop tools and technologies that enhance judgment and augment skill? And if we do that, we can decrease surgeon variability, and we can shift that curve to the right. We can improve the standard of care, and we can almost do democratization of here. So that's the vision. And why is it so exciting right now? It's because right now, in the past 15 to 20 years, we developed only electromechanical devices, staplers, harmonic scalpels, very one ball, all that. But now when we layer on a digital component, now we put sensors on these instruments, robots, and we start to generate data, aggregate data, and process that data, we can gain insights and predictions that will actually feed back into the surgeon or into the operating room in real time. That's what we're doing at JHS. And that's why I'm there, because when I told them this is what I've been trying to do for 20 years, and I feel that I've moved the needle fairly, and probably not at all, because in academia, it's really hard, despite the centers at UCLA and the center here. And they have the same vision, and the difference is they have a lot more resources than me. And so, but it's a collaboration. And everything I heard this morning, 
we need to figure out how to better work together with industry. As I tell everyone, I do, I do feel like I went to the dark side, but I'm on the dark, I'm on the good side of the dark side. So <laughs> I'm in all of R and D, not the commercial side. So my job is I separate sales from science, and I've driven that through the company. And I have the lawyers at J and J writing up roles and responsibilities for everyone in PCM that we do, we, we cannot be influenced by all at all by marketing or by the commercial side of the organization. Our job is to do what's best. If a study demonstrates that our product is not working correctly, that's it. We take it off the market. We, and that's what I tell my team members. So this is where I sit there very hard because I get calls all the time. Such and such is not working here. The data doesn't look very good. Great. I'll take it over now. Anyone has any questions? But that's we're not probably, you know, we're not we're gonna publish what's there, or we're gonna stop our production, or we're gonna change the design. And no one wants to hear that because it's a cost to that, but it's the right thing to do. So you we all can have various influences wherever we are, but you just have to stick to your heart and do the right thing. So that's why I'm there. I'm trying to drive this. Um, it's there, it's hard because it's a big organization, matrix, just like Yale. So getting things done takes time. We're not agile. It's like the Titanic and trying to turn this thing takes a long time. But that's where these skills help because you begin to influence. So what I want to share with you, so we're coming out with a new robot. We have a robot on the market now called Ion. I'm sorry, um, Monarch. I don't know if you've heard about it. So it's a flexible scope for bronchoscopy. Fred Mall, who's the founder of Intuitive Surgical, started a company called Horus. Horus basically worked on developing this robotic device. So the idea was it's really difficult to get out to the 10th, 12th branch of the bronchial tree by manual uh, driving a pulmonoscope. So what they've done is they've developed a robotic device that actually, with navigation, so electromagnetic um, fields and um, being registered with prior CTs, it can drive exactly up to where you need to be in the peripheral lung, and then you can biopsy a small lesion. The standard of care prior to this was peripheral lesions were all biopsied with high you know, miss rate, but high technical uh, uh, need, and also uh, the risk of the renal thorax. So they developed this. It was in production about three years ago. J&J &J said this was like cool technology. So we have an arm that basically goes around the world checking out companies all the time. We do one of two things. We acquire, so we have acquisitions, or we actually put money into the company. So we have JJDC, which is the Johnson & Johnson Development Council. Fortunately, I have a board, I'm a board member of that. So every two weeks, we look at what we're investing in around the world and we follow those investments. And so then it gets us in early, it gets us some equity. If we decide it's a successful company, we then can bring it in. And we probably, I think, currently have $2 billion invested around the world in small companies. We have Oris was on the radar. We went out, we looked at it, that was great. We bought it for three and a half or five billion, or three and a half billion dollars uh, with secondary um, deliverables, but it's basically a three and a half billion dollar purchase. Brought it in house, and at the time they were thinking about what else they can use Monarch for. What beyond the lung work can they go? So they were working in urology, and so creating a reader script that you can drive the body. But it's, when I heard that, I said, That's stupid. I do a shipload of universities. I can, we were talking about it last night. You know, you get bored to the point that I can put a guide wire in, trust your scope, trying to get the ureter. I mean, it's just, it, why would we need something like this? When I saw it, I understood. It. And when you watch this, and I'll talk about it at the end of the videos that I show you, remember, scale and judgment. And are we basically augmenting scale and enhancing judgment? And if we create devices that do that, outcome or performance starts to vary, that variation in the outcome narrows dramatically, as now we're doing it. I tell everyone, think about a surgeon in a cockpit. They're surrounded by technology that's augmenting their scale and enhancing their judgment. The likelihood that that plane's going to take off flying land we know it's almost 100%. We don't even think about it when getting on a plane. When you walk into the operating room, that's not necessarily the case. And that's why today, if someone gets diagnosed with prostate cancer or bladder cancer, what's the first thing they do? They call everyone in the world they know to say, where should I go? All right, so Dr. Martin, uh, give his uh, perspective on bedside bench, innovative approaches to advanced urologic research. Dr. Martin? Okay. Okay. First, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Weiss and Dr. Stuhlm for great talks today. I'd also like to thank uh, the Air Department for inviting me to, to speak. So today I'm gonna talk more about uh, translational work that's happening in the lab. So some of the questions that we have that we're trying to answer in the lab is, does heterogeneity within the tumor microenvironment impact how the tumors respond to treatment? 
Can we distinguish the indolent tumors from degressive tumors? Do primary tumors progress differently than metastatic tumors? And does this impact the therapeutic targeting? Uh, will driving to, uh, immune cells towards the tumor cell, the tumor enhance therapeutic outcome? So for some of these questions, we had different approaches. Uh, one is we're using omics or transcriptomics gene expression, looking at the heterogeneity of tumors. Uh, we also looked at tumor targeting with nanoparticles where we could encapsulate imaging components or therapeutic components. And today I'm gonna really talk about some of the more recent work we're doing with mouse modeling and how we're using more innovative uh, model design to try to answer these questions. So I'd like to just talk about the research strategy that we have that first we're trying to identify clinical specimens that we're using. So if that's at the bedside and then we're gonna identify uh, targets uh, from the clinical specimens, move into developing, developing an effective mouse model, then get in some preclinical trials, and hopefully this will lead down the road to clinical trials. So the first one is identify clinical specimens. So we have a prostatectomy. And as you can see, this patient had a four plus four, which was one of the types of tumors we were interested in. And just to, as you know here, the prostate, uh, presented prostate involvement is only 10%. Also, there was no lymph nodes that were involved. So even though it was an aggressive four plus four, uh, this was one of the uh, tumors that we we're interested in. So from here, we were looking at the pathology and there was only one little, one region. This is a human h &E slide. And we have a zoomed in area here on the right of the high grade uh, four plus four region. So this is what we were interested in. The rest of the tumor was more benign. In addition, we did the same thing for bladder. So just setting up a couple models. So again, for this patient, we're interested in a high grade uh, tumor. This one had micropapillary subtype. Uh, again, there was no lymph nodes that were involved. Looking at the pathology of it, uh, we see that there's aggregates of these micropapillaries that you can see. Yeah, and you, you can see that there are former aggregates into these spacings. So this was an aggressive disease. Uh, Michael Papillary is only about 2% of bladder cancers that they have this. Uh, so now that we identified some patients that we're interested in and we have the histology on them, we were looking at, uh, can we identify some targets? So one of the targets we're looking at is we uh, set up is more of a multiplexing. So this is of the human slides of bladder cancer patient. The green here is uh, vimentin that's stained. We have the red is staining the vasculature, the smooth muscle actin. We have the purple here, CD4 as a helper T cells. The blue is macrophages and the yellow is the cytotoxic T cells. And what we're looking at here, as you can see the box uh, on the left of the slide is, uh, is the cytotoxic T cells. Can we get these T cells outside to invade into the tumor? So this, this was the first step of just looking at it in uh, patient tissue. So for, for the next part, again, we want to look at, uh, start working on the, the mouse model, how this can come together. Uh, so a traditional mouse model, you have the patient tumor, you characterize the tumor, and then these different color mice represent the different types of outcomes of that tumor. So the brown mice had no tumor growth, the blue mice, we cryopreserved the tumor. The green ones, we moved on and further uh, engrafted into additional mice. So after P0, we went to P1 and further characterized these mice and then froze those ones back, the, the tumors. And then we have a, a population or library of tumors that we can have that we can start drug testing. And from this, we further characterize or we can look at the impact of the drug on the, the tumors. So what I'm describing here is really the traditional patient-derived patient xenograft model. It's not a new model. It's been around for many years. Uh, the difference with this model is, for, at least for prostate cancer, there's very few places in the world that actually can create a, a prostate tumor model. Uh, they're difficult to create and take a, a team of people to create them. Uh, one of the good benefits is that it has, you know, you're testing the efficacy of a drug on the tumor and you don't, you're not worrying about the other impacts of the microenvironment. So the initial uh, histology I showed you came from a patient and we set up, uh, this is a, a xenograph where we uh, implanted uh, patient tissue into the mouse subcutaneously. And you can see here, uh, just zoomed in here on the tumor itself, and you can see the vasculature of the tumor. 
So it's a nourished tumor, it's getting uh, a lot of blood supply and then it's actually growing. So here's of this tumor, we can see here's a growth rate of the tumor size. And after about three weeks, we saw an increase in the tumor itself and which lasted three, four and kept going. So this, this uh, PDX uh, of the, of the it was actually of that patient that I showed you initially of the growth rate. So that, that's the orange line you're seeing growing. The blue line across the bottom is of course, some mice don't grow or the tumor doesn't take. Uh, so we want to further characterize this particular PDX tumor and uh, look at some markers. So one of the first one, this is a fax plot. We're looking at PMSA, PSMA, and you can see in the bottom right quadrant of the cell population, we have about just over 30% of positive cells in this tumor. Also, we're looking at cloud of four and we have about 38% were positive for cloud and four. So it just helps us uh, try to characterize what we have. Uh, one thing about this uh, model is that from the original patient who didn't metastasize, so we kept following this mouse and over time, uh, this mouse actually uh, formed mets. So our green circle here is the tumor, initial tumor implant. The yellow arrow on the top is a lymph node met that the mouse formed. And on the right side, the white arrow is actually a liver met. We also had kidney mets from the same mouse. So this patient produced all kinds of mets uh, that initially, of course, weren't seen on the, from the prostatectomy, I guess. So if we kept, if the patient kept going, I guess you could indicate it probably could have metastasized. So we're looking here at some histology. Again, the primary site, you can see a sheet of cancer cells on the far left, the lymph node met again, had a sheet of cancer cells and you can see the kidney met in the middle. You can see the, the cancer cells throughout, throughout the, uh, the kidney itself. So one good thing about having uh, the model now that has METs versus primary site is that we can actually compare different sites. And this is very new data, just a couple days ago we collected it. So we can't really say what the difference is at this point, but it's all we can say really that there's differences in the primary site and the MET site. So if we're looking at PSMA across the top two panels or cloud, and we can say that there are different uh, levels of tumor expression compared to the MET sites at, at this time. Uh, so from going to the prostate and jumping back into the bladder. So this is the PDX that we generated from the bladder cancer model. Uh, this is micropapillary. So this same, uh, same histology we see here is the same as originally back in the patient. So over multiple passages, we didn't lose any, any, any of the histology. Everything kept the same in this micropapillary uh, phenotype. Uh, we also looked at facts plots of the different staining uh, of, of this to try to characterize it. So we looked at cytokeratin 14 and 6A, and you can see we had 53%, 34% of positivity of the cell population. And as uh, Dr. Petrolak mentioned earlier, we also looked at nectin 4, and we had 45% in this particular uh, uh, PDX of CD4, uh, of, of sorry, nectin expression. So what I'm explaining again, the traditional model is the PDX model. And what I'm proposing right now and what we're, we're working on is a little more complicated. So we're actually taking uh, the same patient, we're actually taking blood from the patient uh, and, and then isolating human uh, immune cells, as well as the tumor cells and making a humanized mouse model. In addition, at the same time, we're taking the same tumor that we implant into the mouse and we're actually extracting tills from the same tumor. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. And the goal really then is to look at combinations of drugs and TILs uh, to see what impact they have on tumor response, as well as what, it, what impact it would have the on the tumor microenvironment. And we think this combination could have a big, larger consequences to tumor growth. So as I mentioned, the TILs, so we uh, were able to, you can see on the left is the tumor, and this is in a 2D culture. Uh, the tills are on the right. You can see what we can extract. This is actually from a prostate, which is known to be a cold tumor. And we can extract uh, and isolate, sorry, tills from, from the tumor. And now we have a protocol that we can actually expand the tills out at least 50 fold or 50 times at the moment. And we think we could probably get up to 100 times what we're extracting out of the, the tumor. So if we look at these tills, and on the right here, you could see, so we're looking at CD45. This is CD4 and CD8. So here you can see we have about 58% positivity of CD4 cells. And on the right, the cytotoxic T cells in the tills itself, there's just over 18% that's there. Uh, so 
what does all this mean? These are just, this is a, having TILS is just another ther possible therapeutic arm that we can use in combination with what the drugs we're about to use. Uh, to jump back and look at the mouse model itself. So the first, the next phase we're looking at is the difference in the humanized mouse versus the wild type. And the big difference is when we uh, injected the immune cells, we can see that we have uh, the presence of CD, human CD45s in our mice now. And you can, you can see here in the spleen and in the blood in the wild type mice that didn't receive this uh, injection, you can see virtually no, uh, no human CD45 cells. And of course, the mouse has CD45, which is present in all, in all three. So where does this lead us to? Well, now we're set up for some more additional preclinical trials that we can actually start testing some, uh, some therapeutics. And again, I call the bench to, uh, bedside to bench is because really we're looking at the patient first and then trying to move it to the bench. And of course, the main goal really is like all we're going from the bench uh, bedside to bench and then really back to the bedside is the ultimate goal if we can uh, come up and this will be of course a future direction so i'd like to acknowledge uh, some people that helped uh, steve mayer who's been Mayer, who's been helpful in all aspects of the work that we're doing and of course definitely want a big thing to the the residents here i mean without your help and collecting blood and consents and bothering you for all those things it'd be very almost impossible to to do this work so a big thank you to you guys. And I'd like to just end it on a slide of myself and Dr. Shulam when we're recruiting from, uh, for urology in our, our department early on. And also Dr. Weiss was recruiting me as a Jets fan earlier on when I first came to. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? I have a question. What did Tills may have said? Oh, sorry. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So they're lymphocytes. So, okay. yeah. So, great. What, uh, how, um, we just obviously had a couple patients. Couples. What, do you envision this being on a per patient basis, ideally? Or would you be able to extract and grow these? Or how first line is going to be? Or is it more of a model? I, I think we could, again, it really depends. We're learning a lot in the last year and a half about making these models and you know, aspects of why they grow and why they don't. And I think that, of course, the more aggressive tumors or patients will, you know, we were thinking that they were definitely going to grow first and sometimes they didn't. Um, so we're, we're still learning, but overall, I think this is something that we could apply to, to individuals at, at some point. So I think this, this could work on all aspects. So right now, you know, we're, we're just still learning how to make these mice grow. I guess the, the bladder is just taking a little longer for some of the tumors to grow. Um, and prostate, this, this one shot up in three weeks and we had fully metastatic mouse in, in three weeks. So it's a very aggressive tumor. So I guess, again, it just depends on the type of tissue we're getting that we can implant. What's our success rate with the uh, prostate pediasis? Uh, right now, they're a little bit on the low side because it's just, again, just not knowing at the beginning of what we're doing. We're playing around with testosterone and all kinds of components. So it was a little lower, but uh, is also amount of how many mice we have available, how many fragments we can implant. And I think that's, it's more of a numbers game at the moment. I think that's going to be the real changing piece. Yeah. It, it, is a, it was a great talk. That was fantastic. Yeah. It is an opportunity to compare some of the more aggressive tumors, ones that are metastasized quickly for the genetics to see the difference for the ones that don't implant. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a good point that that's, I think that'd be excellent to, to try to do to get those. Okay, uh, next up we have a presentation from Ankar Choksi. He's a second year uh, resident right now. Um, his career fellowship interests include endourology and mineral lace surgery. Probably more excited now after Dr. Sholem's talk. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. <laughs> um, and he will actually be talking to us about a QI project that he and a number of the residents have been working on with Dr. Uh, Martin about introducing the Yale, he's gonna be introducing the Yale Urology uh, robotics curriculum to us. All right, so like uh, Dr. Mona Medina mentioned, uh, I'm gonna be talking about that Yale Urology Robotics curriculum. This has kind of been in the works for about two, one and a half years now, um, trying to fine tune it and make it um, relevant for the residents and kind of maximize their learning potential uh, with this curriculum. And so our team consists of Dr. Martin, who is gonna be our faculty, who is our faculty advisor. Then there's the senior resident involved in this project, that's 
uh, Dr. Seagal, Daniel Seagal, and there's uh, Dr. Khan. He's my senior, but then he's uh, Danny's junior, and there's myself at the end, who's the junior most resident. So I do whatever my seniors tell me to do. And so I'll just introduce it. You know, surgical training started off with the Halstead model. There's still very much facets of that in the education we see today. Um, basic structures of surgical training. Um, there's graduated responsibility. You start as a junior resident. You learn the basics. And then as you get older um, and you get more experienced, you kind of get more involved and take more responsibility and ownership of the patients you take care of. But since 1889, when Dr. Halstead was operating, a lot has changed. And that's mainly because of the robot. And, you know, that kind of takes away some of it because there's only one person that's able to operate at a time um, in a closed, confined space. And so a lot of these institutions have already started to create a uh, robotics training um, curriculum, in, both with robotic surgery and laparoscopic surgery. If you look back in the Journal of Urology article back in 2011, um, Dr. Lee presented some of the practices that kind of um, create a good formal training education. And goals within this program include bedside assistance and getting competency with that, um, how to do port placements, how to position a doctor robot, and eventually being competent with the individual steps of the case. And essentially in elements that we'd wanna create within the curriculum ourselves is having mentorship with the faculties, mentoring the, uh, the residents and the fellows, having dual console platforms, which we do have here, um, having dedicated bedside assistance after we've gained that competency ourselves, and then using the robotic simulation labs to kind of focus and fine tune our skills before utilizing them um, in patients themselves. And what we'd like to additionally include is a video library that has a whole database of recorded surgeries that are performed here at Yale by Yale surgeons so that we can learn from the very best themselves. And so this is what our SharePoint site would come to when I'm looking at it. Uh, that's Dr. Wynn and Dr. Steve. Apparently people say I kind of look like Dr. Steve with the mask um, and scrub cap on. So after Dr. Steve leaves, I'll try to say that's me. Um, our goals of our curriculum personally is to make sure it's flexible yet comprehensive because each resident has their own personal interests um, and goals that they're trying to accomplish. So rather than having a fixed and rigid stream work, allow the residents themselves to kind of take on what they want to accomplish from their five years here from residency. And that starts at the very junior level to the senior levels. We'll transition starting from the simulation skills, training videos, um, in services with the intuitive reps and move that towards console based learning. And overall, the entire end goal of this is to increase the rest of the operative preparedness walking into the surgery, maximize how much they're gaining from the surgeries themselves, and then eventually promote independence. And all of this is gonna be hosted through a private SharePoint site. Um, the individual elements that will be found on the site include how to access that robotic simulator, the recommended exercises to perform, the relevant AUA core curriculum modules that would be helpful in learning. Um, there's the intuitive training modules, um, we also had some in-services and then how to get the mind to the application to kind of, you know, keep a log of all your cases, see how you're progressing within each individual case. This is us um, earlier in the year where we had our in-service with Chrissy and Ryan who are inpatient APPs, just learning how to use the robot, how to dock it, how to perform port placements, targeting, the whole gambit. And then we have a video here um, where a PGY-1 performs a best go urethral anastomosis on one of our training models. We're using a 30 French Foley as the urethra. And then this pink tissue, fake tissue thing that we found in the same lab and utilized it as our own. Um, just gonna see if we can play this video. See, so yeah, that's one of our interns, you know, just practicing on the SI robot. Um, that we have in our sim lab and kind of just doing the entire anastomosis. And then there's the mind intuitive application, which essentially allows for creating logs of all the robotic cases that you're performing. On the left, we have, you know, one of the residents in their earlier training. And you can see as they progress throughout the cases and they've gained more independence and experience with the robot, they've gone to spend a lot more time um, through the cases. I think one of the unique things that we're gonna do is create this video library. And what we're really trying to do is just have a, every permutation of surgeries that are performed by attendings here, have that annotated into their individual different components, and then create educational text or narrations to help our residents prepare before they walk into the operative room. And the benefits of that allow, for the, for, allow us to you know, review the key segments of the procedures, proactively prepare 
for variations in, te in techniques between um, different surgeons, avoid possible pitfalls. And then also when we're reviewing these videos after the surgeries already been performed, we can see how our performance was and see if there's any areas where we can improve ourselves. And we'll also use this for possible direct feedback and identify further areas for improvement. Um, like I said, we'll create um, each, well, each attending that performs the surgery will be recorded and tated accordingly. Um, those cases that we plan to include are prostatectomies, nephrectomies, partial nephrectomies, cystoprostatectomies, tachycolpoplexies, pyeloplasties, ureterectomies, reimplants, and any other such um, surgery. I think we have a robotic uracal cyst excision that's also going to be in this library. Um, there's a bladder rupture repair deposit, um, or a partial cystectomy as well. And any other cool, interesting case that we're going to be doing here, we'd be more than happy to record it and, and annotate it. So this is, if once you get come to the video library, this is a robotic prostatectomy that Dr. Liebman did. And it was, it was divided into eight different components. Um, and all of these have educational text within them and they're gonna be available for review. Um, each one, each, each video is gonna be different in just based on how long that individual component of the case is, um, but they're available for review for residents to see. And then also we're gonna create a community within this video library um, where you can, put comments, um, ask questions um, of the videos themselves and hopefully get the answers that you're looking for. Or you can just um, comment on, <laughs> on your appreciation of the surgery itself. So in summary, we're creating a robotic surgery curriculum. Um, there's gonna be a high emphasis on surgical simulation, bedside assisting, having this dual console learning, faculty mentorship, and then a, a formal review and feedback process. We're also gonna sustain a robotic video library that prioritizes rest in education, surgical preparation, direct feedback. Um, we're gonna use ancillary services as my intuitive lab and CSATs to kind of promote further training. And at the end of this, I think we're gonna create really strong residents that are, have a solid skill set in robotic surgery um, and be a high, anticipate that there'd be a high interest in future applicants coming and looking at Yale, seeing the training that our residents have. Just like to acknowledge Dr. Kim, Dr. Martin, Dr. Hillman, and Dr. Gavallo. They've all had some impact in various different forms and kind of getting this project through. And especially every attending that has received this text message on the morning of their surgery. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Sprinkle. I think there's the gears, um, there's the gears um, criteria for the attendings. Uh, da Vinci itself has a certification platform for residents. Um, so that our goal is that each resident gets the certificate at the time of graduation. All it involves is about, I believe, five to 10 bedside cases that are logged and then submitting a log of your cases. Um, and then just having the backing of your program director saying that you're certified for robotic surgery down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there a so we have the simulator, which um, is going to be moved into the North Pavilion ORs for easier access. Um, and on that, we're looking at a select set of exercises to be performed on the simulator with a club score, I believe, of 80 or higher um, on those exercises. I think with the mind to the application, it'll track um, your use of the simulator and whatnot, and then also your cases themselves. Um, so it's e I think it's e very easy to look into that. Yeah. Thanks. All right, we'll get started um, with the, um, I think the final session, right? Yep. The final session, okay. so. Um, Again, uh, for next introduction will be made by Dr. Adam Hedelman.
All right, let's let's go back to our seats. We start again. Um, Dr. Kim and I were in uh, New York a couple days ago for the New York section's Valentine's meetings. And at the time we kind of were talking, we were reflecting on the quality of the presentations of our re of their residents and these talks they were giving. And we were gonna come back here and kind of twist some arms. But I, I gotta say, now that we're here and seeing the fantastic job that you guys are doing, it really, they have nothing on us. You guys are doing a fantastic job in presenting. And of course, as I say that now, I'm kind of teeing it up for Amir, so good luck. Um, <laughs> I want to introduce Samir Khan, one of our third year residents, who uh, has been continuing on his work with a Mirage Master that he had started during med school. And he's has a future, he's thinking in endourology and minimally invasive surgery, though I've kind of seen a spark in his eye these last couple of months in PEDS urology. So we're, we're working on him. Um, so there's a tear. Oh. Oh. Because I was like, wow, I keep yelling louder, and he seems so interested. <laughs> oh, that makes more sense. Thank you, Chris. He's going to talk today on uh, sarcopenia and systemic, systemic uh, inflammation are associated with decreased survival after cytoreductive nephrectomy for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hillman, for the kind introduction. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, my name's uh, Amir Khan. I'm one of the urology PGY3s, uh, in case I haven't met anyone or in case you don't recognize me with the mustache. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about sarcopenia and systemic inflammation uh, and how they're associated with decreased survival after cytoreductive nephrectomy for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And I gave this talk uh, as a sub-I, a prelim analysis, and as uh, my co-resident Ben Press can attest, it was a long, grueling analysis and revisions and monologues from the reviewers and lots of frustration, but it finally got published in Cancer, so I was very happy about it. So I'll be um, talking about what we found. So no financial disclosures, a conflicts of interest, uh, hopefully someday, but not now. So just to give some background. So renal cell carcinoma uh, accounts for 2 to 3% of all malignancies. An estimated one-third of cases um, present metastatic on presentation. And, um, you know, 20 to 40% of clinically localized cases eventually develop metastases with a median survival less than two years. So obviously very important to, you know, understand metastatic kidney cancer and its treatment. Cytoreductive nephrectomy um, was historically a standard of care, so removing the primary tumor and the setting of metastases. That was historically a standard of care and a really important component uh, in the management of metastatic uh, renal cell carcinoma, but recently it's been called into question. Um, in uh, the era of targeted agents and the Carmina trial, there's been a shift uh, in focus for the management of uh, metastatic kidney cancer. The thought process behind it is that you have this bulky primary tumor that may be inhibiting the immune system and its ability to combat uh, cancer. Um, but you know the procedure does carry significant perioperative morbidity and mortality. So it is worth investigating its role as a treatment in uh, metastatic kidney cancer. And so what is sarcopenia? I didn't know the term before I started the res uh, research, but sarcopenia is a loss of skeletal muscle mass. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that BMI, you know, a lot of times we use BMI and um, it's it just, it's not a good representation of someone's nutrition. Um, you know, one fact I always, Dr. Master used to tell me, and I always, you know, is that Michael Jordan at the height of his career at a BMI of like 28 or 29. So it just doesn't tell you a lot about uh, someone. It's not perfect. And, you know, up to 50% of kidney cancer patients are overweight and obese, but yet they can still be sarcopenic. They can still be frail. That's really the key point. And so um, what we did was we did tissue segmentation, uh, which can present more precise quantification of body composition. And, um, you know, sarcopenia is being investigated in a variety of malignancies um, and, you know, other conditions as well as sort of this component to consider when you're doing therapeutic counseling and, and you know, thinking about, okay, how am I going to treat this patient? Um, and giving a more objective parameter rather than just you looking at them um, and saying, well, I think they're, you know, have uh, good performance status or that they're, you know, appear healthy, but just kind of giving, putting a number to it. So how do we measure it? Uh, we use the segmentation software called Sliceomatic. Um, it's uh, developed by TomoVision. It's a company in Montreal. The owner is very accessible. Like I had a cell phone number. It was easy to talk to him. Um, basically what we did was we segmented skeletal muscle on axial imaging using CT. And then what was innovative about my study was we did, we used MRI, which hadn't been done before. And it was a lot more complicated because you don't have the Hounsfield units. Um, there was a system I developed that 
they, they later published at Emory about how to do it on MRI. Um, but we would basically go to lumbar level mid L3 because that's been shown to sort of reflect total body musculature. And, um, you know, on CT, you would use the house field units, negative 29 to positive 150 to segment the skeletal musculature. Although on MRI, it's a little more complicated, like I mentioned, I won't, go, I won't get into that. But then you would develop a skeletal muscle index, basically using that area and then putting it over height, uh, patient's height um, in the same way as you would with a BMI. So you're creating this SMI, skeletal muscle index. And so here's a great image. I, I like this image from, um, this paper by Martin et al. Uh, you know, on the top, you see these patients with different BMIs, but yet they have an identical skeletal musculature. Um, so that just shows you like all these different people, you'd see them in clinic, but yet they have the same skeletal musculature. And then here you have patients who have the same BMI, but like, look at the difference in the quality of their musculature. And so that's just telling you that you can't just look at someone and know. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to think about that. There are different thresholds using literature. We used um, thresholds that use gender and BMI specific cutoffs um, to define sarcopenia. So we also looked at other body composition parameters or skeletal muscle density, where we looked at the mean attenuation in Hounsfield units of the seg segmented skeletal muscle. We also looked at different adipose tissues. So intramuscular adipose tissue, um, visceral adipose tissue, which is yellow, intramuscular is the green, and then subcutaneous, which is the teal color here. So this is a paper that we published in Cancer uh, recently. Dr. Sutko was very influential. Um, she, she really taught me a lot on how to do this and she does a lot of great sarcopenia research. And then obviously Dr. Master in the full department of Emory is very supportive. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to them for helping me get this published. Um, but what we looked at, so our study design, it was a retrospective analysis of 158 patients with metastatic kidney cancer who underwent cytoreductive nephrectomy. We had CT on about 69% of them, MRI and 31%. And for inflammation, what we looked at was we looked at preoperative neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, C-reactive protein, and ESR uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate within 90 days prior to surgery. Uh, and we looked at all these parameters for elevated inflammation. So we looked at NLR over 2.5, CRP over 10, ESR over 45. And then we also um, looked at NLR over 3.5, just to give another um, threshold. And then... Um, like I mentioned on the CT scans, because we weren't able to really look at Hounsfield units on um, MRI, clearly, uh, we looked at density, we looked at total adiposity, and then the percentage of adipose tissue for each of those components. Uh, we looked at the adipose tissue attenuations in Hounsfield units, and we also developed an adipose tissue index using the same formula uh, as skeletal muscle. So we looked at all those as well. And then we also incorporated um, what we called modified estimates of the MSKCC score um, and the IMDC score. So we use all the score components, um, but unfortunately this was one of our limitations. We weren't able to capture the time from diagnosis to initiation of systemic therapy well. So um, that was not really reflected in our database given the wide, wide uh, date range and uh, people getting treatment at different, different um, institutions. But uh, we have shown in a paper that Dr. Master's team published that um, this modified score is associated with outcomes in uh, clinically localized kidney cancer. So it is something that we were able to, um, you know, validate. And the main outcome that we looked at was overall survival. And so here's just sample images of, um, you know, unsegmented and then segmented uh, CT scan here on the top. And then I, I use T2 MRI on the bottom. And again, I was only able to do the musculature, um, but it was, you know, it hadn't been done on MRI. And so it was interesting to develop that given there's more MRIs being done. Um, so I think that's useful to look at. So our results, 48% of our patients were sarcopenic. Um, sarcopenia was associated with elevated neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, greater age at surgery, lower BMI, which just makes sense, uh, and higher uh, modified MSKCC score, lower muscle density. What was interesting was it was not associated um, with race or ECOG. It was interesting that it wasn't associated with ECOG or Karnofsky performance status, it wasn't associated with histology grade or sarcomatoid histology. Um, and we didn't uh, find association with a, a modified IMDC score. It didn't find association with albumin, which is a very important point because you know, people will say, well, we'll just use albumin, but this isn't really a radiographic albumin. You know, it's giving you more information than just what albumin can provide. Um, wasn't associated with GFR or Charleston comorbidity index. 
And so in multivariate analysis, we had to perform two separate models because of similarity between the IMDC and um, MSKCC. But we found that neutral lymphocyte ratio over 3.5 with sarcopenia you know, or an elevated CRP with and without sarcopenia had an independent effect on overall mortality. Um, and we found similar results on the MSKCC multivariate analysis with NLR um, in this situation with also 2.5 with and without sarcopenia, 3.5, and then also CRP. And so for over, overall survival, so sarcopenic patients had a median overall survival of 15 months compared to 29.4 months for non-sarcopenic patients. Um, patients with NLR over 3.5 and sarcopenic, so they have sarcopenia and they have high systemic inflammation, had the worst overall survival at 10.2 months. Um, and then here you can see the, the other conditions. So NLR over 2.5, we had 14.2 months. CRP and ESR elevated with sarcopenia was 14.4. Uh, when we had non-sarcopenic patients without NLR with 34.2, and then when they looked at the CRP ESR patients that weren't elevated and weren't sarcopenic, it's 55 months. And uh, we didn't find any significance for muscle density or adiposity parameters. Some studies have, um, so that was interesting, especially for visceral fat. We were, you know, I was expecting that there would be some effect, but we didn't find any um, significant effect on survival. Here, the Kaplan-Meier curves are not, you know, that apparent, but here you can see sarcopenia. Um, you can see the drop off with sarcopenic patients. And then here for NLR over 3.5 and, and sarcopenia. Um, one of our limitations was we didn't have that many patients that were not sarcopenic and also didn't have systemic and uh, high systemic inflammation. So there was, most of our patients to some degree had one or the other. So that was one of our limitations. Um, we didn't have that many patients that weren't sarcopenic or weren't uh, inflamed. So limitations of the study, you know, it's retrospective which is always a limitation, a single center study. Um, the availability of abdominal imaging, we had a wide, um, given it was metastatic kidney cancer, we had a wide date range and we didn't always have available abdominal imaging. Um, we weren't able to, because of the retrospective nature, uh, incorporate other anthropometric and uh, functional assessments of frailty and quality of life, which I think are important. Um, human error and segmentation, although we, we did publish a paper that inter-observer and intra-observer variability was very low. So I wasn't too concerned about that, but there is some level of human error. And uh, the fact that we weren't able to capture the um, data on, on um, the diagnosis time, you know, time from diagnosis to systemic treatment, I think is a, is a uh, limitation because it didn't allow us to get a more complete assessment of the IMDC and MSKCC scores, which are, uh, which I think is important. So conclusions. Uh, this was the first study that evaluated comprehensively looking at sarcopenia, muscle density, adiposity, and inflammation. So all of those factors in metastatic kidney cancer using both CT and MRI. Uh, and so what we found, like we mentioned with sarcopenia was associated with elevated NLR, greater age, lower BMI, lower density, uh, was not associated with albumin. Um, NLR with over 3.5 with sarcopenia or elevated CRP with and without sarcopenia were significant predictors of overall mortality on our multivariate analysis when we used a modified IMDC score. Um, NLR over 3.5 with sarcopenia was associated with the poorest overall survival. And uh, like I mentioned, there were no effects of muscle density or adiposity on survival. And so what are the implications? You know, why does this matter? Uh, you know, I think it's important given the ubiquity of cross-sectional imaging, you know, it's an objective, highly reproducible measure of nutritional status uh, that you can get. Um, that can be used to risk stratify patients. Um, there are there is a paper that they recently that uh, published where they're looking at automated segmentation software where you can just click a button and it can segment. Um, I think I know that's being worked on. Um, and you know it's not necessarily about this specific software or how you do it, but I think that you know the main goal is to sort of get something objective when you're looking at metastatic kidney cancer that you can use to you know individualize your treatment for patients. Um, you know, I think Carmina, while it was a very important trial, you know, had its limitations with accrual, um, you know, people in treatment arms kind of crossing over, um, some patients on suit and getting cytoreductive nephrectomy, you know, a lot of their patients had very high IMDC scores, uh, high MSKC risk scores, which is not really the population where we're thinking of offering cytoreductive nephrectomy. So I think that, you know, you have to take its findings with a grain of salt. I know that they did a post hoc analysis where um, they, it wasn't significant, but they found that there was a potential for benefit in survival for cytoreductive nephrectomy for patients who had a single IMDC risk scores or intermediate patients. So I think there is still 
a role, uh, and, there, and there is still a role for analyzing um, cytoreductive nephrectomy. And you know, sarcopenia itself is shown to be a modifiable and potentially reversible um, condition. And so, you know, thinking about what we can offer to patients preoperatively or from diagnosis to, especially those that we consider are frail. And again, they could be frail at any BMI. It's not just a thing of oh, well, the hectic patient, but they could be obese and still have frailty and poor musculature. And so in summary, um, elevated systemic inflammation with sarcopenia is a significant predictor of overall survival after cytoreductive nephrectomy for metastatic kidney cancer and is associated with poor survival outcomes, most pronounced with elevated neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, sarcopenia via the SMI can pro provide the subjective patient-specific parameter that you can just use on uh, available cross-sectional imaging. And again, I think the preoperative measurement of sarcopenia and inflammation can give you this objective parameter um, for risk stratification and also just thinking about surgical candidacy and which patients would benefit from cytoreductive nephrectomy. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. Shulam, Dr. Weiss, Dr. Kim for their inspiration and for everything they've done for our department. And uh, I'll open for questions. So Amir, uh, congratulations. I remember your stuff I talked vividly, so that shows how effective it Communicating yeah, right. with I'm still looking at you know, measuring that muscle, and it has clearly an impression. Uh, do you think that what we're measuring is a measure of frailty, or is it a disease-specific marker? Right? Is the question is this a reflection of the burden of metastatic disease, and you know the, how advanced they are in their disease, or is it completely separate? I mean. Be yeah, I, I think it's so hard to tease out like which, you know, which comes first. Uh, I feel like it's, it has to be, you know, given this inflammation effect, right? Like we're seeing that it's associated with inflammation, that there's some element, I think a greater element of the disease burden rather than just sort of it being independent of that. That's what I think. And they're, you know, the median survival is 15 months, I think, or something like that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I mean, and they're passing away. They're dying of disease. Yeah. Right? Not other causes. Yeah. Yeah. A related question to that, because so few people actually die of their cancer directly, right? It's usually, unless it's invading some organ or bleed, it's usually a generalized wasting and dying, not directly from the cancer, but indirectly from the cancer. I was wondering the same thing that I want, I know you said it didn't relate to the BMI, but what about the Delta BMI? What about the change in weight from the time they were diagnosed to the time that they were metastatic or along the oh, length of the metastatic? Yeah. I wonder if that's just a surrogate marker for they're on that pathway of anorexia, cachexia, yeah. and ultimate demise. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to look at the kinetics of it. Like, I think, you know, we were limited at not really having those time points well captured, but I think that would be really interesting to look at. The kinetics, yeah, that would be pretty important. Okay, yeah, last question. Yeah, that, that's related to what I was going to ask, basically, if, you, if these were uh, sarcopenic patients who have a kidney cancer, who, who then develop a kidney cancer, or these people who became sarcopenic because of their kidney cancer. Yeah. But a follow-up would be, would you consider looking at this in other stages of disease? And so people who have like high risk localized disease that's fully resected, who are sarc you know, are sarcopenic either you know, uh, because of the tumor or, or for the tumor, you know, does that impact risk of recurrence? And would, would you think it, it might? Yeah, I think so. I, Dr. Sutka, I know, has published it in bladder cancer and I think also clinically localized kidney cancer. And I, and I think and at Emory, this was the first one we did. And so I think they're, they either are working on it or maybe publishing. Yeah, the, the next step was to look at localized kidney cancer. Yeah, based on all these questions, has anyone ever just talked to general, you know, because we have so many CTs, right? Just if you just take a like, random collection of CTs and look at them and see what the sarcopenic index is, what would, what would that number be knowing that these people are two or three or lower? I mean, there's got to be some baseline, right? Is there any baseline data? If we keep looking at metastatic cancer patients, you mean like baseline for an average person? Yeah. yeah, like they, they. I mean, we use these cutoffs based on a paper they had, you know, what would be healthy skeletal muscle index, but it, it depends on the BMI and depends on the gender. So yeah, yeah, that's why it's, it's not really like a perfect kind of, that. it would be ideal, but, and other papers have used different cutoffs. So that's why it's not, it's not well-defined, but hopefully with more research, they can get to a more easy to use cutoff. So next speaker is gonna be Jamil Syed one of our uh, graduating chiefs. He's done a fantastic job. I'll hold off on all of our goodbyes for another six weeks until we decide to let him go. Um, but we anticipate he'll make it.
across the finish line at least. Um, as we know, he'll be leaving us to head to Florida, to Cleveland Clinic, congratulations, for a uh, practice focusing on robotics and oncology. He's gonna to present today some work he did with Dr. Motivadinia on toward ultra reduce Uroski symptoms trial. Join us. Thanks, Dr. Hiddleman. It's been a pleasure to be a part of today. It's been really nice seeing all the different talks. Um, so yep, today I'll be discussing Toradol to reduce ureteroscopy symptoms trial. This is about four years in the making. And so a bit of background information. Um, ureteroscopy for nephrolithiasis is a commonly performed procedure by urologists. Following ureteroscopy, pain is associated with the ureteral stents, capsular hydrodistension from irrigation, as well as longer operative times. Um, it's estimated that one in 16 patients who are opiate naive uh, persist with opiate use after ureteroscopy, and the likelihood of that continued use um, is associated with the amount of opiate prescribed at the time of ureteroscopy. So limiting narcotic use postoperatively has garnered increasing interest amongst the surgical community at large. The use of NSAIDs during ureteroscopy for nephrolithiasis is variable within and between institutions. Our study aimed to assess the impact of Kitaporlac on perioperative narcotic management of patients undergoing ureteroscopy. So the study was a randomized control trial to test the hypothesis that a single intraoperative dose of Kitaporlac would be associated with reduced narcotic requirements in the perioperative period for patients undergoing routine outpatient ureteroscopy. Patients who are eligible were those that were between the ages of 18 and 80 um, who, are going out, who are undergoing outpatient ureteroscopy for renal or ureteral stones. We excluded patients who uh, were unable to consent, who had allergies or adverse reactions to NSAIDs, patients who had asthma, pregnant patients, patients who had active peptic ulcer disease or renal insufficiency. Uh, there were no exclusion criteria regarding the laterality of the procedure use of access sheets or anticipated OR time or preoperative stent status. Uh, patients were randomized on a one-to-one -one ratio to receive either 30 milligrams of Ketorolac or no Ketorolac during the induction of anesthesia. Uh, the primary endpoint was narcotic use, and this was standardized to morphine uh, milligram equivalents. And we looked at the narcotic use uh, intraoperatively given by the anesthesiologist, as well as the narcotic use in the postoperative care unit. Uh, the secondary endpoint was to assess complication rates between the treatment and control groups. The study was designed to detect a 10% reduction in the amount of narcotic use between groups and ultimately uh, based on our power analysis, 44 patients were needed per group. And uh, this is sort of the schematic of uh, the patients we analyzed. So we started with 113 and after exclusions, 94 patients were randomized. We had 46 patients in the Ketorolac group and 48 in the control group. This is just baseline characteristics. So the median age of the patients was, were uh, 56 in the entire cohort. And we looked at the various uh, patient baseline characteristics as well as stone characteristics. Uh, there are really no differences in any of the factors. So then looking at our primary endpoint, um, so when you look at in the PACU, uh, narcotic use within the PACU, there was actually no difference. So when you look at the Toradol group and the no Toradol group in the PACU, there was actually no difference in the amount of narcotics that they received. Intraoperatively is where everything was driven. So the Toradol group received a lot less uh, in terms of uh, uh, morphine milligram equivalents intraoperatively as given by the anesthesiologist. And that intraoperative dose reduction led to an overall decrease in the use of narcotic use when you combined postoperative and intraoperative. So patients who received Toradol uh, in, um, at induction received uh, less narcotics perioperatively. And then just looking at our secondary endpoint for the entire cohort, there were 10 complications reported, most clavian grade one or two. Uh, between groups, there was no statistically significant difference between the number of complications, bleeding, or acute kidney injury. Of the entire cohort, 3% required an opiate prescription post-op. 
So a one-time dose of Futorilac uh, resulted in 37% uh, reduction of narcotic consumption perioperatively. The overall decrease in morphine equivalent use was really driven by a decrease in narcotic delivery intraoperatively. Um, with that goes our limit, main limitation, one of the main limitations was that the anesthesiologists were not blinded and the difference seen in the intraoperative narcotic use between the groups may likely just reflect a bias towards giving those in the treatment arm less narcotics as the anesthesiologists know that they've already been treated with some form of analgesic. So some of the conclusions and takeaway points, so one-time dose of Toradol during ureteroscopy associated with 37% reduction in narcotic use. Um, perioperatively, uh, there was no evidence of increased adverse effects from the use of Toradol. Uh, overall, 3% of patients in the entire cohort required an opiate prescription postoperatively. Um, and I will conclude with that. Certainly want to thank everyone involved um, in the study, especially Dr. Moda Medina, who really, who really led all this. Thank you. Vital signs for the anesthesiologist to see if there was something driving their narcotic use, or was it still taking some of their bias if you had some? Meaning objective? the vital the vital signs of the patients. Well, they needed something to drive what they were giving narcotics for. Yeah, so we we asked, so it wasn't formally placed in the paper, but when we asked them, yes, it's usually you know elevated heart rate or elevated blood pressure that they. Could you see that on their tracings when they gave the medication versus the? Yeah. Food? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for being honest. <laughs> but we but we discussed with anesthesiology their their practice patterns yeah. and when they gave more. Like what is more. The I'm pretty sure there's some you know ad induction. There there's a standard induction bolus that they give the patients that they have to take this for a certain amount of induction for a certain time. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank All right, we're gonna have Jody come up. I think it set us up for the next speaker. Can she hear us now? She can hear us, yes. All right, so we have another uh, visiting graduate who we're very excited to see, uh, Nanaya, who we used to call Agachuku now, but no one knew, uh, who graduated from Yale in 2017. So many of us still remember her. I'm not sure the younger residents would have known her, but fantastic resident, still an Aji. I think Dr. Shul started her first day, right, for her residency, yeah. As you all know, she was a fantastic valued member of the team. She was incredibly hardworking and she won the uh, Rick Dean Compassionate Care Award. And I think she actually won it twice, if I remember correctly, which is a big testament. She then went westward to Michigan where she did a fellowship in health services research and uh, National Clinicians uh, Scholars Program. And then continued her westward movement to UCSF where she did a um, GU Trauma and Reconstruction Fellowship. She then came back east, unfortunately didn't make it as far north as we would have liked is now an assistant professor at NYU. Um, at least she's on the commuter train can come see us, but we haven't seen her in a while. Um, she's doing research currently on patient report outcomes. And I know she has been ghosting me on email because she was trying to put a grant together. At least that was my answer for why she didn't answer me. Um, but she's obviously the answer because she's given a talk today and I think she got her grant out. So congratulations. And um, we're confident she'll be successful in that endeavor. And today she'll be discussing patient reported outcomes in general urinary surgery, where she is uh, continuing her practice. So do we see her on the screen? Welcome back, Nana. Hi. That is in the middle. This is how dedicated she is. She's actually in the middle of clinic. She's between patients right now. So everyone's got to keep it down. She has to get back to some patients in a minute. Welcome back. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Hillman. And I would, I would never go see you, Dr. Hillman. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's so nice to, to be here. I wish I could see all of you. Um, uh, but it's just so nice to be back and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's just, uh, you know, an incredible honor to, to, to even be here today and to, you know, five years later to be talking about my research. Um, but I'll save the sentiment for later and then I'll just get right into sort of um, my research and talk to a little bit about what I've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> next slide, no disclosures. Uh, this is an outline, next slide. Um, I won't talk too much about, you know, all this, um, a brief resume, but, you know, I, I know a lot of the attendees, but I don't know a lot of the residents, and I just wanted to sort of give a little background about myself and, you know, where I am today and, you know, how I got here. And, um, you know, I think the one thing that comes to mind when I think about the research I'm doing now, the research that I've been doing for the past couple of years, is just as I think when I was a resident, a lot of the questions came to me that I uh, think about now, specifically about patient reported outcomes 
Um, I can recall being a resident at the VA and seeing patients who had surgery for radical um, for prostate cancer, sorry. And one patient, patient in particular kind of really stood out to me. You know, I saw him in the office and he actually started crying and I was confused because I said, sir, you, you know, your, your cancer's cured, your PSA is zero, you know, what's the problem? And he said that his sexual function just wasn't what it used to be. Um, and so that patient really stuck with me as I moved on, you know, to the University of Michigan uh, where I did some research and then UCSF and then now, um, as I do more research in patient report outcomes here at NYU. Um, next slide. Um, and, you know, as I was a resident and just being so impacted by, you know, our incredible faculty um, um, at Yale, um, this always, this mantra always stuck with me thinking about how to create a better world for those who live in it. And I think as physicians, this is sort of our everyday mantra, um, but something that Yale really instilled in me as a resident. And it's something I think about when I'm doing my research, you know, late nights or or what have you, it's something that really has stuck with me to, 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 keep, to keep me going. So uh, next slide. All right, so I'll jump right in and talk about prostate cancer survivorship. Um, when I started at the University of Michigan, I started doing, thinking about and studying patient reported outcomes for prostate cancer survivors, just because that was so close to my heart and something that really touched me when I was um, a resident, as I had mentioned. Patient reported outcomes, as we all know, are really outcomes that are reported from the patient, they're unfiltered, unbiased, and straight from the patient, things that we really can't get by looking at the medical record. And when I started thinking about prostate cancer survivors and survivors' experiences, um, prostate cancer survivors experience long-term and late effects of the disease and its treatment, specifically sexual dysfunction, urinary incontinence, bowel issues, um, adverse psychological and relationship effects, and then treatment-related regret is a big one that I think has come up in the literature lately, um, and it's potentially influenced by sexual function. And so I started thinking about all of this and thinking about what we could potentially do um, to address these issues. Um, can you hit the uh, next part of the slide? And so one of the first things that we did was we looked at variation in, in patient reported outcomes by patients, by surgeons. And then we started thinking about, okay, how could we potentially look at this a little bit deeper going beyond, you know, just reporting the fact that these things do happen. And we started thinking about precision medicine and individualized medicine and how we could really potentially have an individualized approach to predicting sexual function for patients undergoing radical prostatectomy specifically before surgery and even after surgery. Uh, next button. And so we developed this prediction model. Um, it's a multivariable and multivariate because it predicts outcomes at multiple time points. Uh, next arrow. So we looked at, we want to look at feasibility, accuracy, and next arrow and outcomes. And this is all in the process. We made the model and now the process is within the Michigan Urological Surgery Improvement Collaborative music. We're basically looking at how we can potentially make this model feasible, how we can potentially roll this model out into real time and how it can potentially help people to have realistic, realistic expectations that could potentially impact uh, decision regret. Uh, next slide. So this is a video actually where I wanted to show just the app that we created um, for predicting patient reported outcomes. And so this is a website that one would go to. Um, you can press play, I think. Oh, and so this is the first part. And so when I say it's multivariate and multiple outcomes, it basically predicts uh, preoperative function, meaning if someone comes in preoperative to see you, and then it can predict outcomes after three months when you have updated data. And so these are basically all the questions that we found were important for the model to predict outcomes. Um, these are all questions from the EPIC-26 scale, which is a validated scale specifically for prostate cancer patient reported outcomes. And so if you put all these inputs in and you calculate, you then get this output that looks at the current sexual function and then potentially predicts sexual function at 12 months and 24 months. And again, I just wanna emphasize that, you know, this model kind of says these things and you look at these numbers and you're like, oh man, that, that looks really daunting. Um, but I think that, you know, it is a potential step to giving people realistic expectations that are personalized and not based on um, literature, which I think is a lot of what is used now, but we can potentially personalize our approach to counseling patients and give them realistic um, expectations. Uh, next slide. Um, so as I was thinking about uh, patient reported outcomes in prostate cancer, it's really a very refined field. Um, a lot of work has been done over many years, I think that has really refined and led to a deeper understanding of the impact, you know, of treatments on um, sexual function, urinary function, bowel function. We validated new measures when I was at the University of Michigan, including some interest and satisfaction measures that sort of look at measures beyond functionality, specifically thinking about, you know, 
a lot of people probably won't recover their function, but what are some attainable measures? And so we looked at interest and satisfaction and found that people actually had a lot of satisfaction despite the fact that they had low specific uh, sexual function. And so when I got to NYU and I started thinking about patient reported outcomes in other populations and how we could really translate a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the, the, the groundwork and foundation work that's been done in prostate cancer patient reported outcomes, um, we started thinking about how we can apply them to general affirming surgery. Uh, next button, uh, next button. And so as we compare patient reported outcomes with prostate cancer and general affirming surgery, in prostate cancer, we really have this very nice uh, tree, you know, a, a summer tree, so to speak, that has all these really refined branches, beautiful leaves, and general affirming surgery really just planting the seeds. Um, as it is right now, there really aren't any validated patient reported outcomes for general affirming surgery. Um, you know, which, which, is, which, is, which is somewhat of a problem as you think about the fact that this is a surgery that is really completely driven by the patient and the lack of these outcomes um, can potentially impact a lot of things such as satisfaction, um, patient satisfaction specifically. And then mainly we wanna make sure that um, there's some evidence of benefit um, for these surgeries. Uh, next slide. And so, as I said, in general affirming surgeries today, there's no validated patient reported outcome measures. And then we started thinking about objective measures, subjective measures, what really are important, what are measures that are important to patient, patients. And then specifically thinking about patient-centered evaluation of treatment efficacy that can be evaluated with patient reported outcomes. Uh, next slide. And so patient reported outcomes for general affirming surgery are really important. And I think probably more important than meets the eye. Um, in 2021, as we all know, there's been a lot of uh, legislation recently to ban prospectus med medical care for transgender youth. Um, the House Bill 1570 from Arkansas, it actually is a call the Save, Adole Save Adolescents from Experimentation Act, where people really have a lot of questions and people are really kind of trying to understand the benefit of gender affirming surgery and patient reported outcomes can really address that gap. Uh, next part. And then the one thing that came to mind and that has uh, come to light recently is that the fact that, you know, this is really targeted to transgender youth, but it's quite possible that people are going to try and extend these to extend these rules to adults and these bans. And so I think we have a prime opportunity right now to really try and get a grasp and develop these measures and use these measures uh, to potentially impact patients and provide evidence for policies. Uh, next slide. And so when we started thinking about this, uh, we you, you know, wrote this viewpoint, thinking about and sort of um, articulating specifically how patient reported outcome measures could potentially affect policies. And this just sort of outlines a couple, couple of things. You know, the US Health and Human Services they actually bar Medicaid programs from excluding surgery and care, but only 18 states actually include care. Uh, CMS concluded that the data was insufficient for national coverage decision, and right now coverage is based on a case-by-case -case basis. And so these are all reasons why it's important that we kind of have these validated measures. It will take time, but these measures can potentially contribute to the evidence, contribute to the data um, to show policymakers why these things, are, why, why the surgery is beneficial, why the care is beneficial, and this could potentially impact access. And so we do need standardized, validated, patient center outcome measures with direct input from the TGMP community. Um, and so next slide. I just wanted to briefly talk about, this is a model that we put together thinking about how to develop these outcomes. How do you start to even think about um, developing a measure you know, from, 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 from nothing? Um, and so when we think about the, developing the measure, we think about community engagement and patient centeredness. Um, and that community engagement patient centeredness comes through interviews, focus groups, we really just talk to patients and understand what's important. What are your goals with having surgery? Uh, from there, we then develop items. And then through several steps, we eventually develop a measure. And the measure can have a lot of, uh, like I said, uh, downstream effects um, that, that can result. Uh, next slide. And so to do this, what we're doing is um, we're doing uh, mixed methods, which basically means that we're doing qualitative research, meaning we're talking to people, talking to transgender non-binary patients who are undergoing gender affirming surgery and really eliciting their perspectives about the surgery. Um, and then the next phase would be developing item pools and then you know, some other fancy terms about validation and things, but basically to develop this tool that maybe like the EPIC 26 will potentially lead us to this huge knowledge base that'll contribute to the data, contribute to the evidence and potentially um, impact policy. Um, next slide, next. And so this is an example of the, some of the focus groups that we've done. Actually, we've done approximately 10 focus groups with uh, transgender and non-binary patients. And given the COVID pandemic, we've actually done them virtually. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, and it's been very informative, um, just really learning from patients themselves and talking to them and understanding 
a lot of things about surgery. One example question is, what are your goals? And as people tell us their goals, it helps us to understand how we, speci- how we will design uh, um, this specific um, uh, questionnaire. Uh, next slide. And so in conclusion, I think um, we have a real opportunity to center patients' voices, which can impact a lot of things, including value-based healthcare. And urology has really been a pioneer among surgical fields in patient reported outcomes. And so there's a lot of opportunities and challenges as we think about patient reported outcomes, but I do think urology can potentially uh, lead the way. Uh, next slide. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you again for having me. I'm sorry for talking so fast, but I just wanted to make sure I got through the presentation. And um, it's just a real pleasure, like I said, to be back with you all. And um, I hope everyone's doing well. <laughs> thank you. So Nana, congratulations, great job. Um, I was wondering, you know, one of the challenges we face is in data collection. Have you thought about ways to automate, digitize, or leverage the EHR to collect data once you have validated instruments? Because um, I think that's one of our challenges that I think universally face. Uh, you have these instruments, how do you actually get people to fill them out reliably and track them on the Oh, right, that's right. a, sorry, hello. Okay, right. That's a great point. Um, one thing that we've been working with actually is our um, the team that does the Epic build. Um, we've specifically been working with them to understand how we could potentially integrate the patient reported outcome measures into the EMR. So that, for example, if a patient, before a patient sees you in clinic, um, they'll get these questionnaires and fill them out and then they'll be automatically populated into the EMR. It's been like a, um, an over year long process. Um, so it does take a while and I think it can be difficult. Um, another way that we've looked at doing it is actually through using databases or sort of um, um, automated data um, servers like a RedCap, for example, um, where we can send patient surveys. A lot of our patients are very sort of digitally uh, savvy, and they have been filling out a lot of surveys on RedCap. So that's another way that we've also looked at that is a little bit more feasible than, than, than using the EHR. But it, it is, I think it is a huge challenge just getting the data and automating the data. The way that music does it, um, is they basically send us their surveys to patients through the te- through text messages on their cell phones or emails, um, and then it gets automated into a server that then gets uh, downloaded into the music platform. But I think it is a huge challenge, and we're sort of ourselves working on ways to, to get around that and figure out how to, how to make that feasible. Well, I hope we can learn, because it's, it's still a work in progress here. That's been under, underway for several years, and so hope to learn from, from your expertise and maybe something we can try to wrestle together. Oh yeah, that'd be great, yeah. Okay, Nana, this is Peter. I just want to say thank you very much for making your time to present to us. Um, we're all very proud of you. It's great to see what you're doing. Uh, you will have impact, and I think you're making the, place, the world a better place to live. I'm sorry, I missed that last part. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, really, I really did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't my intention, but yeah. No, no, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Shulam. Um, everyone, everyone I, I meet always asks about you, uh, especially, especially from UCLA. So it's always great to say that we were your first official class. So thank you so much. Thank you. And then I, I, I echo what you said. It's great to see you doing great stuff between you and Mike. I think uh, you're doing the hard stuff in terms of getting the patient data, talking to a patient for an hour, you know, just collecting that data is incredibly valuable and it's a condition which is all so hard to do. So I have this is a very impressed with you and Mike just having your friends. Oh, thank you. And I, I found that it's very difficult to look at sexual parameters when you're going through gender affirming surgery. So when you're transitioning from having phallus and having some level of sexual activity to having a clitoris and vagina and having a different level of sexual activity, developing a validated questionnaire is incredibly difficult. And one of the things that I've been I'm interested in all of you have worked with me and kind of come up with something valuable, but I just kind of want your thoughts on something like that. Yeah, and that, that's a great point because um, 
you know, we, we've had all these focus groups and we talk a lot about sexuality and sexual function. And one constant theme that's come up, I think um, in, tra in transitioning is just people's expectations. Um, they sort of expect one thing and then, you know, it's sort of not what they expected. And what I've found actually is that a lot of patients actually um, say that they're, 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 they're not um, sexually active, um, spe specifically because for whatever, for so many reasons, but I think it's just about expectations. But as, I think as far as developing a question, you know, I think it will be hard, especially as we think about um, a questionnaire that could potentially be used universally. I think, you know, for example, for um, phalloplasty, vaginoplasty, metoidoplasty. Um, and so we've actually been thinking about potentially having to use different questionnaires specifically targeted um, for phalloplasty, metoidoplasty, vaginoplasty, just because it's such a different um, I think um, experience for patients you know, in the transition. A huge point that's come up, I think, are when I think about sexuality specific topics that have come up um, have to do with um, 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 climax uh, specifically is one of the, the top questions that, that has come up. Um, um, satisfaction is a huge one that's come up. Um, um, specifically um, thinking about um, people's satisfaction as they um, transition and then move on to have um, um, you know, relationships. Um, so those are, I think those are probably two huge things that will be part of it, specifically climax and satisfaction. The other thing is, um, you know, I think specifically thinking about phalloplasty, um, you know, penetration, I think is a huge issue because not everyone has that goal. Um, and so I think it'd be hard to have that question and then think about people's different goals. And so it will be, I agree with you, it will be very complicated to think about how to specifically come up with something that addresses those issues. But so our plan is to really think about the questions and then as we get the data, we're having more focus groups with patients to talk about the questions that we think are potentially relevant from the first round of focus groups. And then from there, um, I think, determine what potential questions we could have and then have, que have patients themselves actually vet the questions. But I think it will be difficult. So a suggestion for maybe you and Michael, uh, I mentioned this before that uh, one of the great things about seeing patients at Cleveland Clinic is that they would have the patients in the waiting area fill out at a kiosk this thing about their activity. So the moment you saw them, you would have their MET score right in front of you if you were thinking about bringing a patient to the operating room. And I think it's hard to get patients to fill things out after they've left the clinic. I think it'd be a good thing to have. It's just these kiosks or iPads are handed out while they're waiting to fill out surveys like that. AUA, SHIM score, RAND score, EPIC, whatever it is. And you get more honesty when patients fill it out when they're not forward facing with the physician, although that's relatively proximate to facing the physician. And it could be it just put straight into ethics, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, too. Thanks, Anna. All right. Okay, much. Thank you. All right, um, so um, next, uh, we're going to move on to the, uh, uh, Dr. Leslie Ricky. She will talk to us about what do women know about water health. Leslie? All right. Thanks, everyone, for sticking it out. Bitter end. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you all today, giving you some updates about what we've been doing in the prevention of lower urinary tract symptoms, our PLUS consortium, and also what we've um, discovered about how women learn about their bladder function and bladder health. So the PLUS Consortium is a multi-center, multidisciplinary network that was funded by the NIDDK that was established in 2015. We're currently in our second cycle right now. And uh, the reason it was formed is because the NIDDK has always had a very treatment um, focused uh, agenda. And they recognize that lower urinary tract symptoms were becoming more of a public health burden and public health issue that was just becoming uh, one becoming more frequent as the American population was aging and to this concept of the hidden burden, like all the other medical conditions that are associated with lower urinary tract symptoms. So they started to really um, develop, uh, they wanted to advance the prevention science in their portfolio because it really hadn't been done before. So the overarching goal was to obtain the necessary information to plan future interventions that will promote bladder health and prevent lower urinary tract symptoms. Why LUTs? I don't have to tell you guys, but there is an enormous economic, social, and individual burden. So there's a financial impact. There's decreased work productivity to the um, society at large. And then in terms of the individual, there's really significant 
uh, physical and emotional impacts. <clears throat> and um, as you can see here with other comorbidities, there's probably a bi-directionality where having the lower urinary tract symptoms uh, makes it more difficult to manage some of those disease processes and some of those increase your risk of LUTs. Um, also, LUTs independently predicts increased healthcare utilization, even when you control for age, race, and other comorbidities. So where is the current clinical strategy? Of course, we're all urologists. Um, you know, we're here to treat conditions that have already emerged. So this isn't just specific to urology. This is most chronic medical conditions. There's a symptom and disease focus. The measures are necessarily, um, they prioritize diagnostic precision. So you can phenotype your patients and then uh, target the treatment um, to those phenotypes. Um, however, this means that all of our information about um, diagnosis is confined to the very small amount of people who either have the condition or who have uh, come forward with their disease. And so there's all, it, this has really limited our understanding for how LUTs evolve you know, over time. Someone just doesn't show up in your office and it showed up the night before. I mean, it's something that's been going on over time. So where could there have been an intervention earlier to prevent them from getting to the end of the bell curve? So a prevention strategy, first of all, you have to be able to define and quantify bladder health. This then takes into, the advantage of this is then you have the entire population characterized, not just the affected portion. Once, you've, I, once you have this outcome measure, then you can start to identify risk and protective factors. And then after that, um, you can start to implement primary, meaning you're preventing the disease in the first place, or secondary prevention where you identify early disease. Um, and this can look like integration into healthcare systems, um, more uh, of a hospital you know, system type awareness, it getting it getting talked about in doctor's offices and also health promoting policies in the places where we all work and live. So this um, actually, you know, this reach this, this is a word cloud showing what the investigators in the plus consortium looked like for the first cycle. It's still pretty similar. I always tell my team I'm the least important person on the team. You do need the content expert, the clinician, but what you really need are people that understand behavior, prevention science, epidemiologists. It's a really rigorous health this um, like a uh, study discipline prevention science. You don't just say, hey, I think this is what we should do and you're able to implement it into policy. It takes a lot of work to figure out what some of these, uh, uh, what, what the, again, distribution of health is and disease and then how you can start to prevent it. So like we've heard about before, I appreciate Nana and Mike and Danny already talking about this. So it makes my work a little easier. Uh, we are trained in medical school and to really focus on not just the individual, but very limited, teeny tiny individual biology. Not even, we're just starting to understand, or I guess it's been known in public health for a while. We're really just starting to appreciate, I guess is a better term, the role of even human behavior and how that biology manifests and how they accept treatment. And also, um, there's also um, interpersonal, institutional, and then community factors. So for example, like we heard about today, there might be somebody, you might have this really, all this, all this, all these millions of dollars are spent like determining how you can prevent or treat advanced prostate cancer. But if that doesn't trickle down to the person, if they don't understand why they're doing it, or they're really concerned about the side effects, so they go to your office and they never come back. If their doctors aren't using neurologic guidelines, if there's regional variety, then that person isn't getting that treatment and it's just gonna widen disparities. So health behaviors are determined by multiple, multiple factors. And there's been multiple studies that have shown that some, an individual's health is like some small part biology and the rest of it is all their contextual environment. So you have to consider all these things when you're coming up with a treatment. Um, and I think especially in like benign, uh, benign, like lower urinary tract symptoms, like a, an enormous amount of the scientific literature stays in the scientific literature. Like it never gets out to the people that know it. Like it's still shocking to me that women from all different walks of life and socioeconomic strata are shocked when they have incontinence after they have a baby. Like just absolutely shocked. Whereas everybody in this room would be like, what? It happens all the time. They don't know. No one's talking about it. And there's so much data on it and they just don't know. So it's not enough just to do the research. You also have to figure out as Nena just said, what is important to your population and how are you going to message that out so that the science actually gets implemented. And as you can see here, this is the work um, plus conceptual framework taken from that social, social ecological uh, model. There is the biology that's very important, but then you can see all the ecological or environmental um, systems that also affect an individual's health. 
Additionally, we've taken a life course perspective, again, acknowledging that most chronic diseases start in childhood. And so this is probably where a lot of the interventions can start to happen. So Rise for Health is going to be a, is a longitudinal study that is launching as we speak across eight of the clinical centers. And it's gonna look at the uh, distribution of bladder health and then change over time. So we had to develop a bladder health scale measure in order to get that distribution. It's probably not gonna look like a bell curve, but in order to get that measure, um, and so that was done, just as Nena said, we started with focus groups. I'll talk about those in a minute. And just exploring where girls and women were, what, what did they think about bladder health? What do they think about bladder function? How do they talk about it? And then their language and those themes were used as a kind of template to develop the questions. After we developed the questions, we went back and did cognitive interviews to make sure that the, I mean, because all of the measures we have right now are for people that are already symptomatic and have already sought care, so they sort of have that language. So if you talk to somebody, for example, we found like little tweaks in the language. Like if you say to somebody, do you leak urine? A woman might say no, like on a questionnaire. If you say, have you ever leaked urine in the last year, even if it was a little bit, all of a sudden it goes up to 20%. Now you might say, well, why is that important? She only leaked one or two times a year. Well, 20% of people that leak once a month are gonna to advance to once a week over a few years. So you, we don't know who those people are, but we wanna figure out who those people are, not just at the end of the bell curve, but who are the people in the middle and how to stop them moving along into disease. The bladder is also a little different in that behavioral um, like lifestyle choices and how you use that organ, I think is different than any other organ in the body. Um, you know, Of course, like your lifestyle choices are gonna affect your cardiovascular health, um, your brain health, like different things like that, but your bladder you're using over and over again, and there's behaviors and myths and beliefs that get ingrained into that behavior that probably affect your risk of bladder disease over time. So you hear about nurse bladder, doctor bladder, teacher bladder, like all these people that have restricted access. Um, and so we also have developed a knowledge attitudes and beliefs measure because that may be a key place where you can start to make some changes, but right now we're making everything up. And the women reflected this in these focus groups. Maybe you shouldn't hold it. Maybe you should hold it for longer. Maybe you should drink more. Maybe you should drink less. We really know ab like really nothing. Um, and so here's that focus group study I was talking about. Uh, the range of ages was 11 to 92. They were um, separated into age groups. So it wasn't like the 92 year old, the 11 year old. Um, but there were 360 participants and it is just a huge database. We actually uh, my investigator, um, Deepa Kaminga in um, adolescent medicine here, she led the group that did all of the coding of all of that data um, with some other people. So what we learned from that is in the absence of having structured platforms that either happen in school, at home, in the healthcare system, women learn about bladder function through social processes. So first there is um, interpersonal relationships. So what you hear from your friends and what you hear from your family. The problem is that this probably results in normalizing LUTs, like, oh yeah, that happens to everybody, or oh, it's just something you have to put up with, or, or it doesn't get talked about at all, and then you think like you don't want to tell anybody about it. Um, there's also a pretty high risk of lay theory spreading misinformation, or at the very best, um, information not based on any evidence. There's also observing. So this might sound like obvious, but a lot of people don't, and this probably goes along with everything else, like arthritis, with musculoskeletal disease, you don't really appreciate it as a condition until you develop something wrong, right? So you don't appreciate your hands working every day for you or your eyes until something goes wrong. And then all of a sudden you start thinking about, oh, like what happened? What did I do? Could I have prevented this? You know, could I have done something sooner? So changes in one's own bladder function, this is a big one. Social expectations are what is normal or appropriate. You learn this from watching others. Um, and from what's expected of you, uh, kind of norms, right? So like, you don't leave meetings, you don't leave the classroom. Um, this person, you people listen to other people peeing, like, oh, is that what my urine's supposed to sound like? Mine doesn't sound like that. Is that normal? Am I normal? Why are they so fast? Why are they so slow? Like, all, this is how people learn about it because we don't talk about bladder function. Um, and there's also self-regulation to fit into norms. Anybody that sees women will hear about like, um, I, I'm embarrassed at work because I have to get up more than everybody else and leave the meeting. And they really feel a stigma around this. It's not like incontinence. People all think it's incontinence. It's a stigma. Even overactive bladder can have that stigma. There's also this um, concept of gatekeepers, right? So at school, you're penalized. You're penalized and you're, and you, or you get like two seconds in between classes. And so, or the bathrooms are terrible and dirty and disgusting. You know, I, I've heard 
multiple stories from kids in schools in the New Haven school district. There's no soap. Like, like who wants to use the bathroom with even like my, my like son, you know, who, I, you know, he doesn't even brush his hair in the morning. He'll be like, I don't want to use the bathroom. There's no soap in there. So um, also something that's been noticed is ease of access between men and women. And this is for a myriad, some, you know, people say, oh, well, women just have more overactive bladder. It's not just that. Women also menstruate. They have to use the bathroom for other reasons. They're usually the ones taking care of the older people and the younger people. Like there's tons of reasons. And so um, one only has to look at any kind of public area. This is Radio City Music Hall. This is the women's line, right? It's like 30 deep, five wide. I hope like that kid in the back isn't like doesn't really have to go because this is what the men's lounge looks like at the exact same time. This is shocking, but this is everywhere you look and this is something we've just accepted as normal. So what do the kids in that line think? They're like, oh, I guess like all women have to use the bathroom. We have to wait. I might pee my pants. No one cares. I can't use that over that other bathroom with the nice lounge and there's no one even in line for it. So, you know, really we need like gender neutral bathrooms because th this is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Radio City looks like a pretty nice place to be. Um, and then there's also how women delineate normal function. And this is based on experience and perceptions. One of the things that came through is a healthy bladder is one you don't have to think about. You don't have to plan. It's not just an absence of symptoms. That's easy. Like, so if you say to someone like, uh, you know, do, do you leak your, you know, do you leak when you cough, sneeze or exercise? No, but guess what? They're not exercising anymore. Like they're not running anymore because they were leaking. They still, all those women say no on the questionnaire, but it doesn't capture their experience. So it's also the ability to participate in that daily activities. Um, women were overall very frustrated by the lack of systematic guidance, um, information to lack their understanding. And so these are some quotes and you can see this is all across the age spectrum, even, uh, even a, uh, an adolescent was saying, I, I don't think a lot of people know what happens to your bladder, uh, when it is affected, it would be useful to know. I didn't like, I didn't know any of these things could happen until they happened to me. Um, everybody tells us how to keep our bodies in good shape. Nobody tells us how to keep our bladder in good shape. A 65 year old, I go to the doctor every year. I don't ever remember a doctor discussing bladder health. And then this other one, which is something we, we really need to combat. There's not a main source. You just get it in piecemeal. You know, hopefully, you know, if you have a, a, a family environment that sort of knows about like a, appropriate toilet training, um, maybe they give you like a healthy start to it, or maybe they don't. Um, so we really need some better platforms to tell people about their bladder health. So although the the, the goal of the, of the study is to identify opportunities, just as critical as how you're going to disseminate. So it's another, um, it, another paper that we're publishing is one that understands women's preferences for messaging. Like what, what would, how do you want to learn about this? It's not for me to figure out how they're going to learn about it because I'm probably going to get it wrong. Where do you want to learn about it? Where is it going to be most impactful? How should we do it? Should we do it like the poopery? You know, everybody loves the little spray and a lot of people brought that up. Probably social media for younger people. Older people still want pamphlets. They like the ability to bring stuff home and look at it again. Um, and just like we've heard today from um, other people, it's really like important that we start um, grounding the, the measures and the dissemination and the research process in the people that we want our research to affect. Otherwise, we're, we're going to get it wrong. We're either going to be well-intentioned and it's not going to go anywhere, or they're not going to want the treatment, or they're not going to take it up. And then, like I said, all these millions of dollars we're spending um, are not really affecting the, the target audience that we're really, really trying to help. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, and this is just a, a slide of all the different um, members across the consortium. Thank you. You know, there's, this is really interesting actually because I, I see people don't think about their bladder health and what makes the bladder healthy and how do you keep it in shape. Mm -hmm. Do we know what we can do to prevent what, sir? Is there any data out there to figure out? The very, very little bit of data is probably in the um, pregnant and postpartum literature. There's like two, there's a, a one study in older people and then a bunch of studies in like pregnant and postpartum women that doing like pelvic floor muscle exercises um, can help it prevent incontinence at least in the first 12 months. That's about all we have. And even within that group, it, it's not, there's probably people at high risk and low risk. 
So we did a study that had like, um, a, a, we did a secondary analysis of a postpartum group that was a high risk group. So we had all sorts of different measures like everyday discrimination and stressors and food security and all that stuff. When you took all those other things um, into account, um, it was actually stressors that predicted your LUTs at 12 months, even more so than like race or your delivery mode. Um, and then with older people, it was shown that by also instituting a, a pelvic floor um, education and exercise class was able to prevent onset of symptoms at 12 months. So that, that's, a bit, that's about it, Kegels, like that's all we have because there's been no research in it. We only understand the really affected people. We don't understand all, the whole rest of the population. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Adding cleanup. Last talk of the day. Thank you. So I'm going to show one of our uh, second year residents who I think is not committed to a career yet, but considering academic urology. He's been working with Dr. Weiss on his talk regarding Dr. Clyde Deming, visionary during a turbulent time. Looking forward to it. So, you know, thank you and good afternoon. Um, my name is Som Lokeshwar, and I have the honor of presenting about Dr. Clyde Deming, a visionary during a turbulent time. Uh, for me, history is inspiring, and I think it keeps me going to hear about these legends. So, as any urology story starts, it starts with Dr. Hugh Campton Young. Um, urology became a specialty in 1910 uh, when he was appointed chief of urology at Johns Hopkins. Um, Dr. Churchman, after um, his training, arrived in New Haven. He was primarily a general surgeon, uh, but he performed the first cystoscopy in 1913. And cystoscopy those days, we didn't have you know, our, our SPOR six and nine. Um, cystoscopy was performed in one room and they had to wheel a patient through these hallways where a lot of times, you know, these tunnels would lead to the morgue, they would get lost and they would have to go and find the x-ray suite on the opposite side of the hospital. And it wasn't until 1919 uh, when they established urology suites with an influx of more patients. And in the 19, in 1920, there was establishment of um, ORs just outside of the main ORs, which were painted red. And these were called the Chamber of Horrors because of the screams. Um, <laughs> so in, uh, in 1921, uh, Dr. Harvey, who is uh, the chief of surgery here at the time, he appointed a young surgeon, a young budding surgeon, Dr. Clyde Deming, to come to Yale. Um, and this is a nice picture of uh, Yale New Haven Hospital um, before Smilo and all of that. <laughs> Um, so who was Dr. Clyde Deming? Um, so he was born in Cornish, New Hampshire in 1885. He attended Bowdoin College. Uh, he was a principal for one year straight out of college. Um, and then he attended Yale Medical School, graduating in 1950 with a cum laude. Uh, he had multiple other um, awards, which he won. Um, and after that, he, became a, he began a surgical residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, in 1919, he became interested in all the diseases involved with urologic care. And so like most urologists there, he went to uh, study with Dr. Hugh Campton Young for two years. Um, as a young surgeon now equipped with uh, cystoscopic knowledge, he came back uh, to Yale um, and he, uh, to establish the new section of urology. Um, and he was appointed assistant professor with a salary of $3,500. Um, a lot of times when I you know, speak to older attendings, they say, oh, you know, these days you're not paid enough, but here, uh, Dr. Deming, as a, uh, an attending physician, was making about $56,000 by this standard, which is less than our, our interns. Um, <laughs> and um, his initial cases were venereal disease um, and cystoscopy diagnosis. Um, urology was still very taboo. Uh, so for patients to come in and see a urologist, it was very extenuating circumstances. Um, and his first uh, surgical case, which took a few months to get, was a periurethral abscess. <laughs> Um, and these are some nice pictures of the medical school and, uh, you know, Yale Hospital. Uh, the picture above was actually the first ambulances they had after the horse-drawn carriage. And um, so this is a young Dr. Deming. These are the, you know, the, uh, the uh, stairs right outside of our uh, Fitkin building. Um, I, I stood here once as well. <laughs> Um, and so Dr. Deming um, in 1921 was formally appointed uh, chief of urology. 
Um, within the first few years, he performed over 600 cystoscopies annually. Um, in 1923, they established um, outpatient rooms four mornings a week. Um, and in the afternoons, um, they had a clinic, which was run by medical students and interns under the watchful eye of Dr. Deming. Um, he also purchased the first 100 milligrams of radium uh, for the implantation in the bladder and the prostate, which was at that time a treatment for malignancies and other diseases. Uh, in 1924, the first resident uh, was appointed to urology at Yale, and this wasn't, you know, this wasn't a formal residency. This was a general surgery resident who had a rotation, whether or not um, he liked it, he or she liked it, uh, to come to urology. Um, in 1927, they finally got rid of, you know, traveling through the tunnels, and they combined a cystoscopy suite um, with radiology at the Farnham building. Um, and in 1932, just uh, 12, 11 years after starting his uh, academic career, uh, he became a clinical professor. Um, and in 1934, finally, the first formal resident after three years of general surgery training uh, was appointed to be a urologic surgeon resident. Um, so Dr. Deming was heavily, heavily involved. Um, like Dr. Weiss was saying, I'm sure he worked more than 80 hours a week. Um, he performed over 3,000 perineal prostatectomies. Um, he developed the Deming nephropexy, and I, I was speaking to, uh, you know, one of our attendings the other day who said, you know, what's the relevance of the Deming nephropexy? We, we don't perform nephropexies anymore, but a lot of the surgical techniques he described, we still use today. Um, he performed over uh, 100 scientific papers. He was truly a Renaissance man. Um, he studied hormonal therapy for urogenital cancers, he, uh, which is a very important study. He performed a, the first heterologous transplantation of a human bladder, uh, papilloma into a guinea pig's eye, which kind of laid the groundwork for growing uh, tumors in the lab. Um, as you can see, it was very meticulous. Um, and the, the graph above is actually from his original publication, which I, I, I'm curious how they used to you know, publish these, these charts, but nonetheless. Um, he also was one of the first to use estrogen for prostate cancer, which kind of helped us um, dictate uh, dosing strategies for those with uh, prostate cancer and low testosterone. Um, and he also looked at hormonal therapy and cryptorchidism. Um, he also uh, was, a, I guess, an architect as well. Um, this is one of the beds that he had created in a certain positioning uh, for the lucky patient who was undergoing a prostate And so while he was doing all these great things at Yale, um, he was also huge on the national level. Um, he became a AUA president, uh, president in 1946. And it was truly a turbulent time. 1946, as you know, is the year right after World War II. Um, there was an influx in war-weary uh, surgeons. There was um, you know, patients with a lot of urologic traumas. And there was a paucity of urology in general in the country um, as people were not getting their kidney stones addressed, their bladder stones, their sexual dysfunction, um, and their venereal diseases. Um, and so in his 1946 presidential address, which is one of the most famous AUA presidential addresses, um, he outlined what he called progress. Um, and progress was that uro urologists had to unify, unify as one, um, whether it was with guidelines, whether it was with standard, uh, standardization of best practice, um, and that there was a scarcity of state level urology. And his vision was that in every community, there was urologic disease, so in every community, there should be a urologist. And he worked tirelessly to work with community leaders, to work with the government, to get funding, to get um, you know, extra, extra money to kind of bolster the ranks of urologists. Um, and he titled this, The Status of Urology and Urologists Following Two World Wars. So later life. So he was chief of urology until 1954. Um, that was 32 years as the chief. Um, he died in November 10th, 1969. And his biographer uh, writes that he was an optimistic competitor to the end of his days. Um, he was five days after a cardiac arrest um, and he gave this interview and he was still talking about all the surgeries he's done and that he could go right back into the OR if he had to. Um, he was survived by his wife, Evelyn Kimball and his son and his daughter. Um, and the legacy of progress outlined by Dr. Deming truly lives on. Um, this is actually a painting, I think it's, um, I think it's in Dr. Kohlberg's office, actually, um, of Dr. Deming. Um, this was by uh, Mr. Keller. He was a uh, biographer at the time, biographer and artist. And you know, through the through the uh, the efforts of our department, through Dr. Shulam, Dr. Weiss, um, and Dr. Kim, I think we're ushering in the Roaring Twenties. Um, 
We have over 32 faculty. We went from 600 cystoscopies 100 years ago to now 24,000 cases. Um, we have you know, the latest technology. We have a high growth rate. Uh, we have wonderful residents um, in many locations. Um, so I want to say thank you to Dr. Weiss. Um, he supplied me with a lot of the information on this. Um, he also supplied me with uh, the history of Yale Urology uh, by Dr. Bernard Lydon. Um, and thank you to Dr. Modamadinia for the, the modern research. Thank you. That's a fitting end, I think, to, the, to, to our day. Um, again, I think I alluded to it earlier, um, but I think all the presentations, all the talks from our faculty members and our residents really highlight uh, what we've accomplished. And that would not have been possible without the leadership from you know, our previous leaders. Again, that's what we're honoring our legacy. Oh, incredibly grateful to Dr. Weiss and Dr. Shulam. Uh, for what you have done for our department. I th I'm also very excited, I think, because of the presentations and talks that were given today, I think gives a glimpse of the future, what your urology will become in years to come. So again, I'm really grateful for all your time, all your effort today. Um, so in, in closing out now, uh, we do have a, um, a gift that I want to um, give to Dr. Weiss and Dr. Shulam, and Dr. Shulam has something to say right after that. If that's okay, Dr. Schwinn? Okay. All right, great. So um, can you put that up there? So, okay. Well, Dr. White, so what, from what I was told is that, you know, you have every single Yale memorabilia. Yeah, that's true also for Dr. Um, Shulam. So we were just trying to think of, you know, what would be something that we can give you? So um, this is what you're going to have in your new in your office. So, <laughs> all right, because we were told. And so I was told that of this uh, during the COVID that this couldn't be or the uh, the plan in your office um, you know was another casualty of the COVID. <laughs> All right, so, so you have a new one to take care of. <laughs> so you'll find it in the, when you go back to your office. Okay. All right. Um, and then um, for yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then um, for um, Dr. Shulam. I know that um, you know wine is like your uh, favorite thing, or you know you're really into it. So um, you know I got something. We got something here for you. All right. I'm, again, I'm, you know I was it was actually suggested I take it out and um, you know read it out like what brand it is or what year it is. But you know I'm not much of a wine, uh, you know, as you know, right? So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> however, however, Jody has assured me that you're going to love this. All right. So, <laughs> All right, so again, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, Dr. Weiss. I think you and I um, feel very special to have, uh, have this day for us. I want to thank the residents for the presentation for Joe. Um, unbelievable. You know, I think back when I first came in 2012, the size of the department and the residents took, you know, we're, we have great, we've always had great residents, but the thing that I've noticed over the last decade, is where the residents are coming from. They're at least only throughout the nation now, which is really amazing. So, um, and I think today just exemplifies why that's the case with the quality of the residents, the quality of the presentations. And finally, I just want to thank Isaac. Um, I think you're all very fortunate to have him as your next chair. I've known Isaac obviously for a long time. He's an amazingly gracious person. Uh, when I got into an meeting yesterday, literally with one minute of checking the hotel on the phone line, it's Isaac for walking in. So um, I think of the 10 top lists that I mentioned this, this afternoon, uh, he has all 10 and maybe two or three more than I do. Um, so Isaac, thank you very much. Uh, the team is lucky to have you. And uh, I think Yale's future is bright. Thank you very much. Thank you.